It's Late for Men. William Ospina. Colombian writer, novelist, and critic born in Hervio, a municipality in the department of Tolima. It's Late for Men. What remains for man at the end of the millennium other than rediscovering the genuine sense of the sacred and the beautiful? What meaning does disease, death, nature, and free time have today, devoid of the depth of the mythical gaze? Is it, as William writes, smoothly in these six essays, late for man? Introduction Paul Valery wrote that the two dangers that threaten the world are order and disorder. This text revolves around the order and disorder of contemporary society. An idea runs through him, that perhaps the kingdom of man has come to an end. The civilization founded on human supremacy, on the idea of the superiority of our species, must give way to a more respectful order, more cordial with other creatures. He also wants to point out that man will only find the path to his own survival if he abdicates his arrogant throne and discreetly submits to the powers that truly govern life and sustain the universe. This return to the perception of the divine in the world may well be what is confusingly insinuated in the complex disorder of this end of the century. Perhaps in the terrible power of science, in the overwhelming influence of technology, and in that growing indiscriminate hostility of man towards man that we call military industry and terrorism, it becomes clear that the supremacy of the human has lost its justification, that it is necessary to look for ways out of that naive arrogance, and that being something much bigger than what we must now save, it is too late for man. From the first of these essays, The Romantics and the Future, written at the beginning of 1993, all the others have been born. William Ospina It is quite evident that, unless the colossal rate at which we are advancing can be slowed down, and this is not to be expected, or else, which, fortunately, is more likely, to be opposed by opposing forces of equivalent magnitude, in the sense of religion or deep philosophy, with centrifugal irradiation opposed to this religious centripetal storm that drags us to the vortex of the merely human, the natural thing is that this chaotic tumult, freed by itself, tends in itself to evil, in some spirits to madness and in others to a reactivation of carnal lethargy. Thomas de Quincey, 1845 It was too late for man, but early, yet, for God. It was too late for man, but still early for God. Emily Dickinson The Romantics and the Future Bertrand Russell wrote that the highest moment of European Romanticism had not been a poem, nor a canvas, nor a symphony, but the death of Byron in Missolonghi, fighting for the freedom of Greece. With this I wanted to express that Romanticism was not a mere pictorial school, a poetic or musical movement, but a vital attitude, the spirit of human generations at the end of the 18th century and at the beginning of the 19th, a way of assuming the world and our presence at as they recede in time, the phenomena become more visible. Fifty years ago Hitler could be seen as a lucky and fanatical soldier, as an indecipherable mixture of arrogance and ambition, today we are beginning to see it both as a revival of the cyclical and terrible Germanic vocation to purify the world, here too the sensitive idea of ending poverty by killing the poor sometimes arises, and as one of the most savage proofs that the nihilism that the prophets of the 19th century announced to us is already among us. Romanticism is more visible now. Not only as the highest moment of the Western spirit in recent centuries, but as the solid ground where the effort of our time to find alternatives to the barbarism that grows on the planet could be sustained. By the end of the 18th century, the efforts of intelligence had congealed into vigorous rational systems. The French Enlightenment, English empiricism and German rationalism had brought to their fullness the cult of reason, faith in human progress and confidence in man's ability to understand the world and order it in his own way. All the positivism that has ended up imposing itself on the West was nourished from this rationalist luminosity. But the main tendency of positivism is to reduce the vast and complex universal reality to a utilitarian discourse that only accepts what is logically demonstrable, what can be calculated, measured, clearly explained in its origin, and can be expressed in rational formulas. A universe thus reduced is sufficient for the purposes of this civilization, today dynamized by the blind force of big capital, 
and driven by profit as the only great general purpose of the species. If this attitude had been unanimously accepted by humanity, we could have little hope for the future. A world thus reduced to its most obvious manifestations and its most useful mechanisms only promises the death of the human spirit. The loss of humanity in an orb of meaningless things, of matter without transcendental meaning, the confusion of all values and the loss of all purposes. The desecrated universe in which we live today, the one that journalism describes to us, the one that advertising sells us, the one that tourism offers us, that universe explored by science, manipulated by technology, transformed by industry, is gradually changing into a kingdom of rubble where all religion is left over, where all philosophy is left over, where all poetry is left over, a vertiginous and evanescent world where everything is disposable, including human beings, where the innumerable possible meanings of everything are reduced to a single meaning, its usefulness. Thus, as is known, nature has become a bank of resources. Sources of energy the stars, sources of energy the waters, natural resources the forests, raw material all the indecipherable matter, labor of human beings, as far as the eye can see and comprehension reaches, the orb that more sensible ages saw filled of divinities, organized in myths, perpetrated in legends and celebrated in songs, has been impoverished until it is only a labyrinth without a center, matter without an object and without a soul. Excluded all that is doubtful and confusing, the world trapped in the spider's web of reason, that great dogmatism that invalidates all discourses that do not adhere to its logic of reduction and dissection, we begin to ask ourselves what are the great achievements that the era of positivism has brought the species, if it is true that in the rational kingdom of merchandise we are freer than under the rule of the old gods and their old myths, if under the consumer society we are more opulent, if under the rule of technology we are more peaceful, if under the reign of reason we are more reasonable. From the faith in progress with which the 19th century intoxicated us, we have moved on to a theory of development that plunged some nations into imperialist arrogance and many others into subordination and passivity. We are no better than the men of old, but we have refined our barbarity. There was more innocence and more dignity in the advances of the hordes of Attila and of the Tartars of Tamerlane, who measured their devastating courses not by leagues but by degrees of longitude and latitude, than in the fields of living skeletons of the Third Reich and in its cyanide chambers. But the triumph of positivism and the rise of nihilism that follows it are not mere errors or caprices of history. The fall of the Christian era and the collapse of the values on which humanity was based for centuries, the loss of a transcendental sense of history, the death of a religion, with its laws and ethics, cannot help precipitating the world into an age of emptiness of confusion. This is how T.S. Eliot has enunciated in this century the process that our culture has followed. Where is the life we have lost in living? Where the wisdom that we have lost in knowledge? Where the knowledge that we have lost in information? Twenty centuries of human history. They take us away from God and bring us closer to the dust. And this is how Nietzsche announced it in his clairvoyant and solitary cries. The desert is growing. Wretched is he who harbors deserts. Since the end of the 19th century, philosophy knew how to warn us, faithful to its possibilities, that dark times were approaching. The most uncomfortable of guests is already at the door as Nietzsche also wrote. Nihilism is already here. Warned of this, we went through our time waiting for the appearance of the terrible guest. We surely sensed a mythological monster, a kind of leviathan whose appearance will definitively mark the end of time. And although we all saw them, it took us a long time to recognize and name them. Now we know where it is. Its name is terrorism and drug addiction, it is consumption and advertising, it is drug trafficking and the degradation of the environment, it is pornography and statistics, it is the empire of profit and fashion, it is war as a business, it is the trivialization of life and of death. Marx announced that all things would become merchandise, merchandise today is beauty and health, learning to celebrate, merchandise art and knowledge, first they sold us earth and fire, today they sell us elemental water and tomorrow we will have to pay for air, 
as the most suffocated on the corners of Tokyo and Mexico already do. And our relationship with the world is becoming more superfluous and more ephemeral. Before, glasses were made to last, so that there would be a significant contact of our life with the stealthy world of things, today the glass does not even last long enough to drink the water it contains, everything must pass through our hands and disappear immediately, the same publicity orders us to destroy it on the spot, in an absurd carnival of evanescence and disrespect for the world. And what is the frenzy of fashion, governed only by the blind impatience of capital, if not the triumph of that plethora of hasty masks, of inconstant shadows for which we are no longer even subjects but merely forms of display. Thus, the homes of the consumer society tend to be transformed into mere terminals of large industry, a well-stocked kitchen, full wardrobes, and in each room, night and day, a television on, providing irrevocable and useless information to a humanity every time more confused and passive. North American society already tends to this ideal, with its strange passivity and that cult of waste that made the poet and an exclaim, the great mistake of North Americans is not materialism, but a lack of respect for matter. To that same order belongs the considerable acceleration that capital, attentive only to its own reproduction, to the abbreviation of its cycles and to the increase of its profitability, has worked on history. We are all agents of that acceleration as if without noticing it. Once it was important to learn, today it matters to graduate. It was once important to travel, today it is just about getting there, and the less you feel and experience the journey, increasingly associated with futility and discomfort, the better it will be. The confinement of humans in large cities, and their gradual incorporation into that rhythm that lives not only on the margins of slow nature, but at its expense, since industry frantically spends its material, often in processes that are not reversible, seems to lead our civilization towards a crisis of incalculable proportions. And more and more, when we look at the phenomena that today are the faces of progress and of today throughout the world, we feel alarmed that any solution is partial and insufficient, that it is difficult to entrust the states of the earth with the undertaking of correct the course and guarantee a future, but that particular individuals do not seem to have the capacity to stop, or even alter, this historical trend. That is why I want to dwell on some consideration of Romanticism. This movement, also the largest and most complex of the Western spirit in recent centuries, arose, as is famous, as a reaction to the triumphant rationalism. It was because light was already flooding the spheres of human life that Novalis wrote the hymns of the night, the clarion call of Romanticism. His intention was clear. What living being endowed with senses, wonders Novalis, does not love light above all things, that divine clarity that fills and strips everything. And after saying these things he adds, but I turn to the mysterious and ancient night, owner of a deeper power. Then begin to celebrate the gifts of the night, everything that remains in the darkness of the unfathomable and inexpressible. From before, but especially from then on, Romanticism extended its nocturnal cloak, protector, and helper, throughout Europe and America, and took on the task of reminding us of the existence of a vaster reality than the one in which positivism locked us up. Reason will be able to exclude from its discourse and even from its consideration everything that is not clearly explainable in its origin, measurable in its extension, foreseeable in its operation and expressible through a system of rational formulas, but even if we do not know how to explain it or measure it, nor anticipate or control it, there is pain and disease, terror and imagination, love, madness and death, there are hopes and premonitions, dreams and delusions, the demonic and the divine. Thus they undertook, not only the vindication but the exaltation of that world of passions and mysteries that constitutes for man the inextricable fabric of reality. For the triumphant positivism everything that cannot be quantified can be contemptible, for statistics there may well not be deaths but rather mortality rates, well there may not be beings destroyed by society and in misery but in sensitive poverty rates, but the real universe is full of real pains and real terrors, of nightmares more intense and memorable than any fact, and of dramas more random and inexplicable than any nightmare. When the windows and vents of reality seemed closed to the spirit, 
the Romantics forcibly opened not only the gates to the fields where immortal nature continued to breathe miracles, but also the skylights and traps that they opened onto the uncharted cellars of consciousness, tunnels and passageways that the world no longer wanted to look at. Someone will say that it is a worthwhile effort to try to exclude from the world everything that we cannot understand and that we do not know how to control. But the monsters do not disappear because we look away from them, and the claim of positivism to banish the dark, confused and inexplicable through the use of what philosophers call the precisio mundi, the precision of the world, the adoption of a language to ignore everything that cannot reason is equivalent to the pathetic exercise of a frightened child who, at night, in order not to see the darkness, makes the decision to close his eyes. Here is the triumph of rationalism and here it does not consist in the kingdom of sanity, cordiality and clarity but in the overflow of passions and we are almost tempted to say, the unleashing of demons. Lo and behold, a host of unknown forces rule over history, and the sages who preached and professed reason exhaust their brains wondering where all the noise comes from. If the fantastic Chinese figures were already under control, what the hell are these? And we believe we hear the voice of Novalis, of that amazing and exquisite young man, who died at the age of 29, leaving the world full of perplexities, exclaiming since the end of the 18th century, that in the absence of the gods, ghosts reign. Romanticism was not, of course, a system, nor did it obey a program. It arose from that same dark background from which the great problems and the great solutions of the species arise. It was a time of passion and exaltation, improvisation, and rhythm. It was a wild whirlwind that lifted a multitude of fervent and genial young men to the highest heights of inspiration and heroism, and then plunged them back into their shadowy confines. The portion of beneficent darkness that they snatched from heaven had to be paid for at a very high price, and I don't know if humanity was aware of that tribute paid to it by the romantic generations. No one has yet answered very well why they died so young, yet left behind splendid works, more memorable and often vaster than that of many men who reached middle age and old age. In France, in England, and in Germany, the very lands where reason had flourished, the voices, music, images, and forms of this new sensibility began to rise, overwhelmed by a jolt of transience and wonder, filled with a sudden mysticism in the face of the gravity and enormity of nature, bent over in the nostalgia of more naive ages, more full of energy and faith. Keats is enraptured in celebration of the lonely song of the nightingale in the woods of night and hears in it the anthem of the immortality of the species, or pauses to hear the silent voice of the dead ages, weaving promises still in the marble friezes. That border the ceremonial urns, Shelley uses the voice of the elements to call for rebellion and the renewal of the times, Wordsworth strives to fill the present with transcendental meaning and to mythologize the landscape, Byron transforms his entire life into a colorful succession of passions and music, Victor Hugo builds his great verbal monuments, Gerard de Nerville reads in the signs of his time not only the evidence of a great misfortune, the solitude left in the spirit by the death of great dreams and the memory of having been in beautiful towers and sirens caves, but also the passage of a prophetic wind that announces the return of a sacred order. Novalis alternates the vindication of darkness with the writing of a fragmentary encyclopedia full of prophetic glimpses, Holderlin closes the enormous task with his invocation for the return of the divine, his invitation to the sacred alliance with nature and his vindication of the poet's role as messenger of the divinity. The Romantics cast a new gaze on the past, where the classics had seen ornamental cultures, as in Greece, or Dark Ages, as in the Middle Ages, the Romantic generations discovered a treasure of unknown cultures, new aesthetic proposals, forgotten beauties, and terrors. Winkleman had rediscovered Greece. He had found that dark, turbulent orgiastic side that after the culture he would call Dionysian. Holderlin, his great disciple, proposed to the world a version of Greece where the gods were no longer, as Schiller thought, beautiful figures from the land of fables, but powers, states of the soul, truths, and destinies. To gloss over a verse by Ruben Dario, the Romantics understood that Greece, it was considered marble and was living flesh. 
and only because of that discovery Holderlin was able to foresee those future divinities that are the heart of his song. But it was above all a matter of shaking the bark of reason and its skepticism. It was the time when the brothers Grimm applied themselves to the recovery of that enormous medieval saga, the fairy tales, the spontaneous expression of the collective soul in an age of great spiritual conflicts. Take a look at the incalculable wealth of the Middle Ages, with its heresies and its witches, with its castles and its kings, with its chivalric legends and its ideal ladies, with its covens and its mystics, with its libraries full of ghosts and its knights full of devils, with its crusades and its liturgical songs, with its lusts and its gothic cathedrals, with its Julian Hospitaller and its Francis of Assisi, with the crystalline skies of Dante and the penitential hells of the Holy Office, the imagination was nourished of Romanticism. Everything was good to be recreated, Tristan and Isolde, Siegmund's broken sword, the greedy dragons of the north, Joan's dialogues with the voices of the forest of Domremy, and those countless creatures, angels, witches, goblins, unicorns, elves, and SYLPHS, monsters, hydras, demons, naiads, nymphs, chimeras, specters, gnomes, giants, and will-o'-the-wisps. But these creatures, today trivialized by commerce, were treated by those men with an astonishing intensity, for once they were believed in, as beings and as feelings, as incarnations of terror or wonder. It is enough to read a story as beautiful as Delicate as Andina, by Frederick de la Motfouk, or Hoffman's Tales, to feel that those things moved and terrified their authors, that they were not, like today, trivial conventions made for consumption by insensitive manufacturers. Few men are as representative of Romanticism as the American Edgar Allan Poe, whose drunken and hallucinated figure usually endures in memory. It is Borges who tells that when Poe was accused of imitating Hoffman's stories, he replied, Horror is not from Germany, it is from the soul. Novelis could have said the same about beauty, Beethoven about passion, William Turner about dazzle, Caspar David Friedrich about reverence, Whitman about enthusiasm, Holderlin about divinity. Unlike the surrealists, who seldom escaped a mere routine of commerce and rudeness, the romantics deeply marked their time, they infected the multitudes with their dreams and their imaginations, they were the soul of a world, and their influence on the world lasted for a long time. Habits of mind and in the sensibilities of peoples. But the world advanced, or retreated, there were more arid regions. Today we can think that Romanticism was an era, but that it was above all an omen. We can compare it, following a verse from Milton, with those first shoots of spring that are destroyed by the last gusts of winter. The presentiment of the future silenced by the forces of tradition. But someone will say, how can that age bent by nostalgia, intoxicated with ancient visions, be like the future, an age that seemed to want to go backwards every moment, an insomniac and hyper-aesthetic age full of gloomy youth, fevers, and nightmares? What can something so shadowed by the Middle Ages, so afflicted with ruins, so confused with phantasmagoria, promise for the future? Isn't it more like illness than health? Isn't it more like pessimism than hope? It is perhaps there where the main secret of Romanticism is found. There is no age of life where there are more tears and more fevers than in childhood, there is no age more agitated by terrors, more impressive and more credulous. And yet, there is no vitality greater than yours. That credulity, which is a form of innocence, may be healthier than the skepticism and suspicion that characterize our time. Today it is forced to believe only in the evidence, but that evidence is nothing more than an illusion. It is necessary not to believe in miracles, and yet the only thing one could believe in is a miracle. Our problem is that we are too sensible, too sane, too precise. Something has been taken from us and that something is astonishment at the inexplicable reality. It would not surprise us to see a boulder float, but we are not surprised to see the planet float. We would be worried that a house would never end, but it does not seem to worry us that the universe goes on without end. It seems to us that a thing ceases to be mysterious by the fact that it is masked in mathematical formulas. And this reminds me of a reflection by Chesterton, 
against those who claim that the universe was miraculously created from nothing, modern scientific theory stands up, showing that it was not a sudden event but a slow and gradual process of evolution and complexity. Of the matter. And then Chesterton adds, and who would think that a miracle ceases to be a miracle because it is deferred in time. The fundamental thing about the romantics is not their themes but their attitude. That is why Bertrand Russell is right. Romanticism was a vital attitude, an age of dreams and ideals, its men were not filled with life by the movement of the markets or current news, they had, as Ruben Dario would say, hunger for space and thirst for heaven, they longed for eternity, and were infinitely capable of dreaming, of believing, and of giving their lives to those dreams. Byron believed in freedom, and for that dream he died at the age of 36 in the Missolonghi swamps. Keats believed in beauty, he gave his life to that dream and his verses are full of that faith. At the end of the Ode to a Greek Urn, he tells us that truth is beauty and that beauty is truth, and that nothing else man needs to know. And in one of his sonnets he wisely bases this kind of religion of beauty that you have proposed. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. A beautiful thing is joy forever. I do not know if it is necessary to insist that this age of reason is an age of disillusionment. It would take many drugs to produce in man an enthusiasm comparable to that which can be produced by a faith or a cause. Man is little when he is not seen as a purpose, when he is reduced to a solitary and passive consumer lethargic by the ideal of comfort. After the long journey of modern society, with its urgency and its machines, with its utilitarianism and efficiency, with its soothing industrial drugs and its sickening industrial cities, with its cults of health, youth, and beauty that in reality they tend to be just despair and fascism, with their frantic supermarkets and shows, after the long journey that brought us to this moving and always frustrated craving for intense pleasures called drug addiction, to this blind conflict between social arbitrariness and individual arbitrariness called terrorism, to this positivist kingdom of sex stripped of all spirituality and sold as merchandise called pornography, to this helplessness of being both jaded and hungry called consumer society, we turn to the romantics to discover in them our lost greatness. There is a man, Napoleon is said to have said in a Weimar salon, pointing to Councillor Wolfgang Goethe. And that is what we men of today can exclaim when looking at those ardent dreamers, all lucidity, and all passion, who understood that reason is an essential instrument to prevail in the world but that it cannot be the foundation of our relationship with the world. Man is a god when he dreams and only a beggar when he thinks. Holderlin wrote at the beginning of his Hyperion. And lest anyone believe that he, a disciple of Fichte at Jena, an impassioned interlocutor of Hagel and Schelling in his student room at Tübingen, a thoughtful reader of Kant and Plato, was a mere disdain of intelligence or someone who neglected the importance of thought, he left written in a poem about Socrates and Alcibiades, these verses. He who has thought the deepest loves the most alive. In this sense, reason cannot be a final criterion for assessing the world. But when she runs out and leaves us with the evidence that we will never fully know the meaning, origin, composition, and purposes of the universe, we always have the love for life, stronger and full of gratitude the more inexplicable it turns out to be. And there, in the place where the wind gets tired, where reason finds its limits, there the divine begins, and the function of art is to reveal it, we make it sensitive to its presence and its influence, to enliven our gratitude. That was the function fulfilled by the Romantics, to renew at the beginning of the modern age, the vital ties that unite us with the mystery, with the divinity and with immortal nature, and leave floating on the spirits, when the deserts of utilitarianism were already growing. And of nonsense, a memory of high destinies and an example of daring adventures, so that something sacred and powerful could come to our aid at the time of great eclipses. Now we need dreams and purposes. The evils that prevail over civilization and that grow relentlessly day by day, require bold solutions, original destinations. We still do not know what faces the divine will assume in the coming times. We still do not know the text of the new laws that must ensure our survival and our freedom. But of the countless human generations, only we are here, facing this challenge. 
Christianity and positivism have already tried in vain to seduce man with the theory of vague luminous futures so that they will accept their present hardship. But, as Whitman said, there was never more beginning than now nor more youth nor old age than now nor will there be more perfection than now neither hell nor heaven than now asterisk. It is here, in these streets and on these corners, where history awaits our response and life awaits our discoveries. I want to make one last consideration. We, the children of this region of the world, have always learned to look at history as something distant and foreign. We could make ours that affirmation of Rambo. True life is absent, we are not in the world. History was a matter of prestigious peoples and illustrious civilizations. We, from the shores, saw the flares and shipwrecks in the distance, we heard the noise of the combats, and we submitted to their results. But here suddenly now, in the wild times of nihilism, history has begun to walk through our streets and we are no longer remote witnesses but protagonists and victims of the great dramas of the time. Now we cannot leave the search for ways for humanity in the hands of others. We all know, without a doubt, that here is the danger. And we can only trust in the truth of those verses by Holderlin. Where danger grows, salvation also grows. The Traps of Progress It is famous that when Sigmund Freud found out that his books had been burned by the Nazis, he exclaimed, how much the world has advanced, in the Middle Ages they would have burned me. In reality the world had not advanced, millions of men entered the furnaces of fascism, to become ashes, and many others were being changed into the rubble of humanity by the practices of humiliation and degradation of that singularly modern ideology. Freud's words would remain as a great irony about his time, and the world would come out of the hells of World War II, to try to purify itself of its evils by incarnating them in a few abominable demons. The 19th century, a good son of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment and other rationalisms, had elevated progress to the great dogma of modern times. If something did not admit replica or doubt it was the evidence that the world was progressing. Servitude was better than slavery. Salaried work better than servitude. And at the bottom of those diminishing hardships the paradise of fraternal society was insinuated, the last step of a progress that had torn us from the animal condition to exalt us in the superior species, administrator, like the Egyptian marbles, of the gifts of heaven, of the earth and the Nile. Humans were the superior creatures of nature, and once liberated by reason we could feel, as Hamlet had said, similar to angels and comparable to gods. It is true that there seemed to be a contradiction between the incessant character of such progress in the past and the expectation of a happy outcome which would ultimately render it unnecessary. Once the ideal society has been achieved, where to progress? But happiness is not the object of criticism. There was still too much misery in the world, and all those questions could be left for later. The idea of progress was the light of the 19th century. The foolish and the wise believed in her. Hegel was their standard bearer. The canons of the French Revolution had been its bugles. Science was in charge of opening and broadening their perspectives. The technique, to deepen it. The industry, to make it obvious to everyone. Who could deny that so many things had never been discovered, so many had been invented, the world had changed so much. Of course the idea was not new. There is no ideology that has not been postulated in history as the great conquest that surpasses and overwhelms everything that has gone before. Christianity had overcome the impiety of the pagan cults and the solitary objections of Julian the Apostate were of no avail. The Ghibelline dream of the great empire surpassed the dispersions and narrow villages of the Middle Ages. The Aristotelianism of Thomas Aquinas surpassed the spiritualism of Augustine. The age of discoveries had broadened the horizon of man, and the discovery of America had completed the new idea of the world. Even the conquest of America had been the perfect environment for Western civilization to confirm its feeling, not only that progress existed, but that it was its promoter and guide. Progress and development was what civilized peoples brought to the good and bad savages of God's new lands. History, then, had nurtured those certainties, and the 18th century finished affirming them. 
That is why it never ceases to sound strange that in its whirlwinds of light certain dark clouds sometimes rose. Contrast with the optimism of the Enlightenment, which would be the faith of the revolution, that phrase by Voltaire. We will leave the world as wicked and stupid as we found it when we arrived. It also contrasts the spirit of Swedenborg who, after having been a cultivator of the sciences, an instrument of progress and of his wars, drifted towards the timelessness of mysticism and towards the complex postulation of a universal ethic. But those lucidities and reluctance could not contain the momentum of the times, and the arrival of the Industrial Revolution definitively installed progress on one of the strongest thrones of the modern era. Even romantics like Victor Hugo believed in him and praised him. Anyone who had suffered an offense against tradition could find vindication and revenge in progress. Everything was going to change, nothing, luckily it would be like before. It was Rambeau who said, you have to be absolutely modern. It is very possible that he believed that his poetry was really that manifesto of modernity, that progress that left behind the vies enormites creeves of the classics. But to think that there is progress in art, in music, in poetry, is simply one of the most widespread and most damaging errors of criticism. Indeed, it is sometimes believed that a work of art can be rejected for not being modern, as others think it can be rejected for being modern. But these attitudes displace the aesthetic discussion to an area that is too unreal. What makes a work valuable is not its timeliness but its timelessness, its ability to make sense to people from many cultures and from many different times. If someone wrote today like Homer or Dante, they would have to be accepted and appreciated, since the aesthetic value of a work corresponds to its internal truth, its organic coherence, and is not due to any external condition. Borges rightly said that the voluntarily modern decorations of Apollinaire's poems already seem old-fashioned to us, and instead the glimpses and feelings of Rilke, a man who never set out to be modern, continue to seem current, that is, eternal. There is no progress in art. Picasso's drawings are neither superior nor more advanced than those made on the walls by Altamira's guest. Moliere is not superior to Sophocles, nor Rodin to Phidias. Each work of art proposes its own ideal, establishes its own level of excellence, and does not refute or surpass other works. This is not only reasonable but fair. To suggest that 20th century humans better perceive the beauty of the world, better grasp its strangeness, and necessarily celebrate it better than humans of other times, is almost like postulating that the roses of New York are better than the roses of Persepolis, is to postulate a cosmic discrimination, a kind of increasing bliss at the expense of the past. The theory of evolution is one of the causes of this idea. In its current formulation, evolution is seen as an incessant process of purification and overcoming previous states of matter and nature. Despite the fact that we all know that the monumental town of the dinosaurs was erased in a short time from the face of the earth, there is still talk of the survival of the fittest in the struggle for life. But what the theory seems to suggest is that all those previous states of nature and of life are something like failed attempts in the search for that perfection that the human species believes to embody today. The truth is that for centuries our religions and our philosophies played the game that we were a kind of astral travelers on a scale on the planet. Unlike stones, we had senses. Unlike plants, we had autonomous movement. Unlike the beasts, we had intelligence, language. Unlike the savage tribes, evidently animals, we had souls. All our effort consisted for centuries in differentiating ourselves from the world, and that allowed us to act as magical foreigners, very distant from the apes to whom we resembled each other so much, quite similar to angels, who bear little resemblance to us. For this reason, when we began to accept that we belonged to the earth, the main concern seems to have been to explain why we were different and better, and evolution emerged as the perfect formula for, accepting our origins, confirming our supremacy. Every difference supposed a superiority in favor of the human. The ant might be more industrious and far-sighted than man, but man was superior because he was stronger and bigger. The elephant might be stronger and bigger, but man was superior for whatever reason, intelligence, ingenuity, cunning, 
perhaps even more industrious and far-sighted. But does evolution really mean progress? Are wings superior to fins? The lungs to the gills? Is man better than the other species? Until a few decades ago, the answers would not only be affirmative, but the questions themselves would seem inoffensive. Today, the suspicion that our species is the most dangerous plague that the planet has spawned has us plunged into a mysterious stupor, and no one would know what course civilization will follow. There are those who affirm, however, that the species, greedy, greedy, savage, fratricidal, persisted for millennia in its conflicts and its efforts without endangering the foundations of command and the orders of the universe, and that it is only the exaltation of knowledge human, the triumph of reason, science, technology, and industry, which has put us in a position not only to destroy civilization but to drag in our shipwreck the rest of naive and magical nature, whose attribute more evident is innocence. Running like the deer over the earth, digging like moles into its entrails, diving like fish into the depths, soaring like birds through the planetary air, reaching like no other creature beyond the atmosphere, man has rivaled all beings in the domain of this world, has made the entire planet his kingdom, and it is amazing to see us not only feeding on every creature but riding the strongest foals, ruling the enormous elephants from their backs, leading vast herds, directing herds of buffaloes, receiving prey brought from the sky by hawks, meekly making ferocious tigers jump through rings of fire, making immense bears do somersaults on colored balls, turning friendly monkeys into pitiful caricatures of humans. In all this there is ingenuity, industriousness, and evident mastery. But there is also I don't know what margin of insensitive cruelty, of disrespect for a mysterious order that has always behaved before us with the elementary loyalty of someone who submits to invariable laws. In the depths of our intelligence a thick fog of stupidity makes us use our talent almost always for heinous designs, there is a strange pleasure in dominating others, be they animals or humans, there is Montaigne said a point of bittersweet voluptuousness in provoking the suffering of others. And on the other hand, the docility, the innocence, and sometimes the passivity of the creatures, are usually seen as tests that deserve to be dominated. It seems that man is incapable of respecting what does not oppose resistance and what does not exercise violence. Thus, the pacifist doctrine of Christ was only accepted by humanity after applying the due punishment of the cross to its founder. And, very human, that doctrine later served to mask and conceal the worst cruelties, the most intolerant and ruthless wars. But man, who has been able to dominate the world and subjugate his fellow men, does not seem to have power over himself, and this is the time when his inventions have taken on an irresistible impulse and no longer seem to be governed by the will of their creator. Man has aroused powers that he does not seem to be able to control, and the fable of the sorcerer's apprentice from Goethe's poem, which amused us fifty years ago in cartoons, today seems to take on the outlines of a gigantic tragedy. It is no longer as obvious as before that man is the superior creature of nature, that his position should be that of dominator and king. It no longer seems so obvious that all evolution is really evolution, that is, it involves progress. It does not seem so obvious that the differences of certain orders between the species imply some kind of superiority and authorize the domination, predation, and annihilation of the others. In the merely natural order, the so-called evolution modifies and adapts beings to other conditions, but it does not seem to ascend towards the formation of a superior type of life on earth, and even if it were so, man does not seem to be that miraculous stem of the long and bumpy process. But the modern mentality not only assumes that man is the perfect creature, that everything must be defined with respect to him, that the planet is his limitless and inexhaustible repository of resources, that the future is the exclusive setting for his comfort and happiness. That all orders of life owe him submission and tribute, and that all matter is unrestrictedly offered to him, but that he has made the illusion of natural progress the foundation of another illusion, that everything in history is governed by the law of progress. Thus, each invention of modernity comes to us as sacred by the idea that every novelty is an advance. Nobody doubts that the cars of today are better than the cars of yesterday, 
few think that the proliferation of cars is exchanging the oxygen of the planet and the right to the ozone layer for a plate of pride and comfort. It seems that we owe gratitude to the forces that build our gallows. It seems that we should shout welcome to progress, every time a new nonsense or a new atrocity comes along. If the vertigo of fashion chains the youth of the planet to a frantic servitude, if cities grow without control and without foresight, dazzling immigrants with increasingly unrealistic promises, if to save the returns of capital pesticides poison the fields, if the military industries work day and night to produce ever more sophisticated instruments of death, if we transform without reflection the matter of the world into inert substances incapable of returning to the sky of nature, if we multiply the monstrous non-biodegradable debris, welcome progress. If technology and industry impose on us an increasingly wild and urgent rhythm in life, at work, in travel, in pleasure, in music, a rhythm that has excluded the divine and will soon exclude the human, welcome. Progress. If the imperative universe of commercial messages relentlessly invades space and mind, if the school increasingly replaces the living relationship with the world with an authoritarian and fossil discourse that usurps the place of knowledge, if the idle inventions of technology make us more and more passive, more sedentary, and more immobile, if the mania for specialization throws us more and more helpless into the hands of ever more obtuse technicians, if science explores the entrails of reality, and threateningly manipulates the universe of the gods without respect and without scruples, progress is welcome. There is no longer any novelty that does not want to impose itself along this path. I guess things once had to prove their usefulness before being accepted, now it seems to be enough for someone to advertise them as something new and someone to sell them as something advantageous. Thus they have managed to invade us, not always temporarily, things that any sensible mind would reject if the itch of novelty did not inhibit reflection. You still see around, depressing and sinister, the plastic vegetation that fascinated humans a few decades ago. There must have been those who believed that progress finally gave us plants and flowers that did not need to be cared for or watered. You can still see that milky and spectral lighting that puts a hospital or prison sadness in every space. The diversity of peoples and cultures tends to be erased by the rise of an international culture of jeans and t-shirts and chewing gum, of homogeneous commercial spots, of massive planetary spectacles, of identical news, day by day rich and curious traditions, complex and meaningful costumes, drinks, legends, a profuse and deep universe rooted in a thousand different ways in the nurturing land, are replaced by a single expression that is almost always evanescent and trivial. Like military leaders, capital takes pleasure in erasing differences and standardizing men. When we are no longer these millions of singular faces each expressing a past, a character, and a soul, but the same being senselessly repeated ad nauseum, this curious modern tendency that calls progress losing all our civilized conquests will have reached its fullness, to dilute in a few imposed colors the infinite variety of hues of the human spirit. Thus, the melancholy affirmation of those verses by Emerson according to which man declines will be fulfilled. Giving up his world star for star. It is possible that some inventions of the time could generate, due to their novelty or their practicality, the illusion of progress. Ever faster airplanes can give us the illusion of immense power over leagues and kingdoms, although we must not ignore that men like Alexander or Marco Polo lived the adventure of the world better than today's busy executives, going every day in the same plane to the same hotel and from there to the same meeting room in the corners of the world that they do not consider necessary to explore because they already know their statistical figures. I also think of those athletic oriental tourists who rush off the buses to quickly take turns in front of the camera next to the corresponding building or marble, and who quickly walk away with their loot of memorable photographs that another day will tell them where they were. For beings possessed by the disease of performance, what progress the machines that abbreviate the processes. For musicians whose work requires more and more profitable pieces, what progress is a device that replaces 20 instruments and their respective performers with a single computer program. No one seems to deplore that along the path of that progress the old delight in doing things has been lost, 20 different ways of producing harmonious sounds, the voices sprouting from the woods and metals, 
the nuances that the souls give when pressing those beautiful objects. Dispensing with the richness of the processes, the pleasure they cause, the beneficial effect that the slow elaboration of things has on the spirits, and preferring only the speed of the results, the times brought us to that apex of renunciation. There are those who think that it is better to listen to records than live voices, seeing small figures of light that live predictable adventures on the screen than conversing with beings of flesh and blood full of moving and unpredictable humanity. But the ridicule of the modern idea of progress is best laid bare in certain seemingly minute details. In the boom of things that save physical and mental effort, in the rise of a culture of waste that invests the effort of thousands of beings in things whose function is to last an instant, things that seem marked by the duty of immediate expiration, things whose use cannot be repeated. A melancholy plastic cup would be the perfect symbol of this wasteful and superficial age if it were not competed with by the two symbolic sticks of our decline, that portable calculator without which we are no longer able to add up the minutes we save using it and the polyhedral remote control that it has taken our domestic immobility to unsuspected degrees of perfection. If progress necessarily existed, the world would not have come from the century of Hadrian to the century of Hitler, from the universal mind of Francis of Assisi to those monstrous tables with elephant legs that are exhibited in certain decoration stores, from the genocides from Genghis Khan to the genocides of Pol Pot. Advancing and retreating in capricious and unruly waves seems to have been the destiny of the human species, strangely detached from the natural order to establish itself without major titles as mistress of the world and arbiter and executioner of the species. But this idea that progress is something obvious and necessary above all stuns us to think about the possibility of some real progress, that is, the result of effort and not inertia, of foresight, and not fatality. Until very recently, the division of the world into developed nations and developing nations made evident the idea of a linear advance that, with sufficient effort and sufficient self-sacrifice, would lead our barbarian nations to the splendor of industrialization, of opulence, and of culture. Today the expression developing could be more of a threat than a promise, but the sad truth is that the world is one and the seeds of catastrophe are well distributed. The general monotony of the life scheme of rich societies, with their only options of work and consumption, drugs and superstition, passivity and spectacle, has its correlate in the prostration of the multitudes in poor societies, with their growing destitute, their excluded majorities, its rise in crime and violence. Every planetary phenomenon has at least two faces, in the north it is called waste and in the south it is called destitution, in the north it is called drug addiction and in the south it is called drug trafficking, in the north it can be called military industry and in the south it can be called guerrilla warfare. But at least it is already evident that there are not two worlds, much less three, but only one, and that any effort to solve the problems of some without thinking about the problems of others will only be stupid or malicious. If the picture that we see today on our planet is the expression of the progress announced by the geese of the 19th century, it would have to be said that the world has already progressed too much, and that any deviation or any setback seems preferable to continuing to enter those dark realms. What seems to await us in the future may exceed the already pessimistic forecasts of science fiction. The maze of civil servants of Stanislalem, the cosmic desecrations of the Bradbury expeditions, the almighty corporations and the shadowy proletariats of Frederick Pohl are little, next to what the planetary mafias promise, the street market for nuclear energy, the proliferation of radioactive waste and the teratological warehouses of genetic engineering. Can mere lucidity, already on the threshold of the new millennium, stop the unbridled race of the foals of progress? Perhaps it would not be impossible if humanity realized that behind the seductions of advertising, the provisions of industry, the prodigies of science, the refinements of specialization and the marvels of technique, lies something insensitive and monstrous, which, flattering the man, preaching his comfort and his supremacy, spurs him on to his downfall. But styles too besieged by temptations, too absorbed in these screens, too stunned by facts and things, too harassed by the need or by the desire to possess, and meanwhile, faithful to the world they must keep pace with, the clocks tick faster and faster. Quickly. The singing of the sirens. 
Like Buddha's father, contemporary society seems hell-bent on preventing its children from knowing that sickness, old age, and death exist. At least in the West there is a kind of religion of health, youth, beauty, and life that contrasts with the increasingly harmful nature of industry, increasingly deadly science and economics. The main instrument of this cult is advertising, which daily sells us an idea of the world from which all the negative, dangerous, or disturbing elements of reality tend to be excluded. Beautiful athletic and happy young people populate that universe of paper and light where no one suffers tragedies that the right product cannot solve, where no one ever ages if they use the right cream, where no one gets fat if they drink the right drink, where no one is alone if he buys the perfumes or cigarettes or cars that are recommended to him, where nobody dies if he consumes well. This curious paradise of well-being and beauty and comfort, perhaps has no parallel in the history of religions, which have always derived part of their power from reminding man of his limitations and the pathetic nature of his destiny. But I dare to think that even the most despotic and undesirable religions were determined to save man, were sincere even in their errors and their misguidance, and instead, this opulent contemporary religion is nothing more than the infinitely seductive mask of a power in human, ostentatiously despising man and the world, and not even knowing it. This strange power has discovered what Skopenhauer discovered, that the destiny of man is nothing more than a chain of appetites that are always renewed, a longing that never finds its definitive satiety, an eternal turning on the will of necessity and in the illusion of satisfying her. But that discovery, which can lead a philosopher to propose the absolute value of the moment, the joy of the ephemeral, and the exaltation of desire that always begins again like Valerie's C., has led the industry to take advantage of that human condition. For the atrocious designs of a blind and sordid accumulation. The values that humanity exalted for centuries as ideal or especially pleasant forms of its existence, youth, health, beauty, vigor, end up being used as decoys to induce men to an increasingly artificial and unjustified consumption. We see those beautiful girls who vacillate between modesty and ostentation, in the most tempting of borders, we see those androgynous young people who copy the gestures of classical marbles, we see these couples as surprised on the threshold of love and desire, everything is their temptation and sensuality, all those bodies are offered, at the same time as promises and as paradigms of a full and happy life in which the ritual never ceases, where fullness has no pauses, where love does not hesitate where vitality does not tire and beauty does not blink, in its studious eternity of photographs and commercial films, and it seems to us that there is a legion of beings working for our happiness. Homeopathic magic works. We come to feel that soda will make us beautiful, that cream will make us young, that exercise bike will make us perfect, that food will make us immortal, and our existence full of imperfections and emptiness and loneliness, seems to touch for an instant the uncontaminated realm of the archetypes. But consumption passes and life follows its combustion and wear. Appetites are reborn and we don't quite understand why there is something in us that is increasingly dissatisfied, something that seems more and more unworthy and more defeated. Perhaps we will never be so beautiful, even if we buy everything they sell us, perhaps we will never be so healthy, so serene, so successful, so admired, so rich. The illusions that force us to buy are revealed to be inaccessible, but in the end the fault will not be in the opulent archetypes but in our imperfection. Seduction takes us by surprise, although we are not unaware that beauty, like all other involuntary virtues, is under suspicion. Before it was easier to know where the beauty was. We had learned it from Greek marble and European art, its canons were established, they corresponded to the image of the hegemonic races of civilization. Before these models, Africans were apes, Asians pale, ugly and dwarfs, American Indians coarse and grotesque, deformed mulattoes and mestizos simple and trivial. But Nazism definitively unmasked the mistake of thinking that certain physical characteristics really entail some kind of morphological, intellectual, or moral superiority. We have seen the famously most civilized peoples on earth professing stupid theories and supporting crimes based on the most inept speculations. And we have understood several things, 
that each racial type composes its own ideal of beauty, that the pure races, with their models of beauty, are but geographical curiosities, that the growing mulatto and miscegenation of all peoples make beauty something much broader, more diverse, and changing, and that beauty itself, with all its power over culture, must be subordinated to ethics and cannot be exalted as an absolute and autonomous value. I believe that today we can affirm that every cult for physical beauty carries within it like a few drops of the most dangerous fascism. And that is precisely how advertising uses beauty for its purposes. The faces and bodies that he offers us are hooks. When we think we bite the shiny sardine, we understand that it was nothing more than the mask of the pointed hook and once again we have fallen into the trap. Novala stated that in the absence of the gods, ghosts reign. At no time in human history were there perhaps as many ghosts as in this icon-papered industrial society, whose multitudes spend their days hearing voices of the living and the dead that are really acetate grooves and tape recordings, longing for living and dead beings that they are actually ink blots incapable of satisfying the desires they arouse, seeing living and dead beings that are actually rays of light. The worst thing is that we look less and less at each other because those vertiginous glass cubes of images are more interesting and at the same time they only demand of us docility and passivity. Books made demands on our imagination, they were made for creative beings, the arts of contemporary technique only saturate and astonish. That is why the beautiful ghost can break into them every minute, the snake of big capital with the juicy apple in its mouth something that no book reader would bear and that we would all understand as a maddening aggression. Advertising, in addition, is purified and refined. It was hard to convince businessmen that it was necessary to replace those clumsy, imperative, and obscene messages, which entered homes only to annoy their audience, with beautiful, cordial and subtle messages whose orders are the most pleasant and most effective. The sirens of capital will sing better and better and there are already those who think that the true art of the time is in those peaceful wedges of cars that do not show rudders or levers or valves but a willow leaf sliding across the surface full of reflections of a lake to the rhythm of moving music. Those idyllic fragments of nature carry in some corner the unforgettable logo exactly in the way that the slave carried the mark of the hot iron. The symbol is there to remind us that what is shown to us does not exist by itself, to remind us that the purpose of the message is not to invite a gentle walk through the fields but to suggest the purchase of a car. To remind us who is master. Nothing ignores that advertising is one of the most authoritarian languages that exist. The imperative of all verbs swarms in their messages. Buy, go, carry, use, always have, take advantage of, decide, don't forget, take, remember, enjoy and they all mean the same thing, obey. Now, with the refinement of the voice of the sirens, the message will tend to become indirect and perhaps the imperative form of the verbs will give way to a language in which the sender appears blurred. Then the message I am the best will be gradually changed to we are beautiful, we are good, we love the world, we love humanity, please keep buying our products. Is this objectionable? The consumer society sells itself as the great provider. At last, by his hand, we men have entered the pantries of an opulent and happy world. There is freedom of purchase, equality of prices, fraternity in consumption. It does not seem indisputable that it is better to choose between five or ten qualities and fragrances of soap, than to be condemned to the black soap of the earth. That it is good to have electric light bulbs, refrigerators, ovens, furniture, innumerable things that individually we could not do. How dare someone raise their voice against the democratic industry that keeps awake to offer men so many necessary things, so many things that would be disproportionately expensive if they were not mass-produced? Aren't companies the bastions of democracy, the antidotes to scarcity, the walls that protect us from barbarism and misery? Isn't it filling the world with messages populated by adorable creatures that remind us of our duty to be beautiful, to be young, to be healthy and to be happy? I believe that humanity would do well to mistrust and mistrust. The history of the powers that by offering some benefit are above all criticism and feel authorized of everything is old. For many benefits, and those should also be counted, that the industry brings to societies, 
it cannot place its interests above the high interests of humanity. But the truth is that the only objective of capital is profitability, the accumulation of surplus wealth that is endlessly reinvested. As long as that end is compatible with the well-being of its consumers, everything is almost fine, but it is clear that as soon as these ends conflict with such well-being, it is not capital that notices it or corrects it. The history of the aerosol, pesticide, detergent, and plastics industry is the most recent and alarming chapter in the universal history of infamy. And no one ignores that the first temptation of the industry when it is seen under suspicion, is not to filter its toxic gases, or purify its waste, or modify its processes, or exclude harmful ingredients, but to resort to the seductive voice of sirens. To distract the public and dispel bad suspicions. For this reason, when a corporation launches a wedge about a non-polluting or ecologically friendly product with loud trumpets, the operation usually hides many silences about the behavior of the rest of the products. Nothing is more reluctant than capital to alter its profitability and its advantages for trivial humanitarian considerations. And this for the elementary reason that capital is blind to everything other than its elementary processes of production, distribution, trade, reinvestment, and accumulation. We cannot ask the dragon to think about the feelings of the maiden who is chained to the rock in the hour of hunger. But vigilance is imposed, because science is unrestrained in its eagerness to know, without the slightest subjection to ethics, technology is unrestrained in its task of dominating the world, without the slightest subjection to an ethic, and industry is unrestrained in its work of transforming universal matter into consumer goods, without even asking what is necessary, what is useful, what is superfluous, what is harmful, what things make us more civilized, what things make us more passive more barbaric. It is enough that they can be advertised or sold for the machines to wake up producing, the televisions to wake up announcing and the supermarkets to wake up selling, in a wasteful, thoughtless, and frenetic carnival. As if, dreams dead, only appetites remain. As if only what has been conceived and produced by human technique were desirable and reliable. That is why we already distrust the pleasant traditional system and we want to manufacture humanoids in genetics laboratories and even in electromechanical workshops. And you have to see, alongside the exquisite artifacts made with the ubiquitous non-biodegradable substances, the countless nonsense and ugliness that can be found in North American bazaars, the endless fripperies that everyone buys and no one wears, the clothes that get old without being worn in the wardrobes in the homes of industrial society, the canned meats that spoil, the appliances that are discarded at the first fault, the cemeteries of debris that grow and that will soon shipwreck the utopia of metropolis. Meekly, advertising announces everything, applauds everything, and makes effective use of the countless and sometimes amazing resources of communication techniques. With its ability to seduce and condition human behavior, it has been invading the spaces of man, suggesting or imposing products and brands, dictating fashion, creating celebrities, tracing styles, and social behavior. Today, when not appearing in the press or on television is equivalent to not existing, this cult of image and success seems to turn everyone's real life into a second-class reality and to the simulacra of advertising, like the simulacra of the journalism, in the only respectable reality. Messages no longer require arguments, seduction techniques only require a pleasant effect on the senses and the intense sensation in the public that their needs will be satisfied by the product in question. It was inevitable that, along this path, even the most serious and transcendental things would end up being trivialized into mere images of seduction. There is no longer a place on the planet where politics does not resort to advertising to sell the image of its candidates. What should they promise? Let the opinion polls say so. Should they show character, or rather familiarity and friendliness? It depends on who you have to compete with. A picture is worth a thousand words, it is said so it is better to publish the convincing photographs and do without words and commitments as much as possible. It was on publicity, before anything else, that Adolf Hitler rose to power in Germany and that his nationalist and revanchist speech spread among his people. 
This should be enough to arouse suspicion about this seemingly neutral technique. An instrument that serves equally to impose perfumes and tyrannies, should require all vigilance and arouse cautious suspicion. But humanity abdicates its high duties of control and resistance, and a plague of lying, hesitant, corrupt statesmen spreads throughout the planet, who have idealized the media and who are subject to the vagaries of public opinion to take even the most important decisions. There is no publicist who does not think that selling a candidate is substantially the same as selling a car or a soft drink. It's all a question of the right image, the necessary climate of trust, of the singular slogans whose function is not to summarize a thought, but to be clearly identified and not look like anyone. And it is this grotesque manipulation that we call democracy. Wouldn't he be crazy if he chose the captain of a ship because of his photograph, because of his smile, because of what his relatives say about him? Increasingly, however, we are leaving serious matters in the hands of less skilled opportunists, because we no longer demand agendas or ideas or commitments but seductive images and smiles of success. However, the worst evil that we can attribute to industrial society and its sirens. It is the contrast between the fantasy universe that they sell us and the growing prostration of the crowds that cannot buy it. Like all heavens, this one had to engender a hell as a correlate, and hell is now the garbage dumps of industry and consumption, where those who lack everything struggle to survive, those who have neither beauty, nor health, nor youth, nor success, no fortune, for whom the hegemonic discourse of the opulent and happy society would be a sad joke were it not for the fact that it increasingly submits them to the pressures of an obscenely inaccessible ideal. It is easy to find them already, in the garbage dumps, or in the ruthless streets, or in the dilapidated suburbs of what is called the developed world, but above all they grow up in the monstrous cities of what they call the third world with science fiction jargon. It is understood that if success and even dignity today depend on the ability to consume, these beings are equated by the prevailing ideology to mere waste of humanity. The pleasant paradise seems to be self-sufficient and is sustained by all those who, docile to temptation, make an effort to position themselves in the respectable zone of consumption. Cars, furniture, appliances, credit cards, prepaid insurance, and annual vacations confer on those who selflessly achieve them the comfortable condition of human beings, free from the atrocious suspicion of failure. Because failure is the domain of the century that is dying, and it is only measured in terms of exclusion from the consumerist paradise. We can be cruel, petty, disloyal, indifferent to human suffering, selfish, greedy, impolite, ethically deplorable, no one will notice in those hardships the failure of their existence. But the failure to acquire and to be able to keep pace with the impatient greed of capitalism is equivalent to losing one's place in the world order. For those who fall off the cliff in that confused herd of vanquished there will be no mercy, no solidarity, no cordiality, no justice. We, the inhabitants of this third or last world, do not need the slightest mental effort to know what the hell of the opulent consumer society, of the smooth and radiant industrial society consists of, it is enough for us to go out into the street. The children of poverty pass by with their dirty blankets on their shoulders. They come from the dumps or go to them. We can imagine the landscapes of revelation where their lives take place. Fetid horizons shaded by the flight of carrion birds, mountains of waste, the detritus of civilization, the final fruit of optimism and human progress turned into the kingdom of the last men. They pass then, before our custom. They come from misery and go towards it, and as they pass they remind us, by an ironic work of the gods of justice, everything that advertising tried to make us ignore or forget. That disease exists, that old age exists, that death exists, and that the proud towers of our civilization are built on foundations corroded by insensibility. So we feel that there, where perfumes are no longer, but their broken bottles, where music is no longer but its devices in ruins, where fashion is no longer but its discarded shreds, there, among the indestructible plastics and next to the dirty and foamy streams, perhaps the true world and the true future are announced then we almost understand the pathetic desperation with which the new fascists, those who do not even dare to show their faces, 
go out at night to murder homeless people under bridges, to try to erase in a stupid way, drunk with barbaric ineptitude, the evidence of the present disorder, to try to convince themselves that the miserable are responsible for misery. And then we understand that perhaps what the world needs is not more things, more cars, more mansions, more progress, more publicity, but a little human generosity, a more vigilant look at the opulent future that the ghosts lie, a little of honesty with our souls, and a little common sense in the brief and dangerous time that was granted to us. The Ice Look It is difficult to remain an emperor before a doctor says Hadrian at the beginning of Yersinar's novel and it is also difficult to keep the quality of a man. Reading those words, I thought I once understood the secret fear that not only the doctors inspired me, but also the scope of their work. The tense silence of waiting rooms, the desolate peace of hospitals, the terrible miracle of operating rooms. It is possible that the fear that these things inspire is due to the patient and inexorable death that lurks behind them and that will one day show its face, but it is also possible that this fear is born of themselves. In reality, Few things reduce man to helplessness and impotence as much as the power of doctors. If a man shakes our hand, he is our equal, but if he happens to take our pulse, it seems that we are at his mercy. Hardly any human lore gives its possessor as much power over others as this ancient and prestigious lore we call medicine. Today it is a division of science and fractally Rami fees into increasingly sophisticated and onerous specialties, but before it was confined to magic and miracles. For centuries its worshippers were demigods like Empedocles, gods like Aesculapius, wise men like Celsus, ultra-wise men like Paracelsus, demiurges, sorcerers, shamans, miracle workers, and miracle workers. They had been given the most beautiful of virtues, the virtue of healing, of snatching mortal flesh from the arms of death and returning it unscathed to the miracle of the world. They deserved all gratitude and all veneration. Furthermore, they alternated the tonics of their science with the medicines of hope, they subordinated themselves to other mysteries, they did not pretend to have lifted the veil of Maya, to be owners of an unappealable and absolute knowledge. They were sacred beings that fulfilled a function, sometimes rational, sometimes magical, in an enchanted world. In that remote world where faith moved mountains, where naive Tei believed in miracles and often did them. Those magical powers were attributes of some beings but the truth is that the common people participated in a certain basic primordial knowledge. Tradition had bequeathed to humans, generation after generation, many secrets and tricks to deal with that network of great wonders and small sorrows that we call life. Pains, fevers, shocks, paleness, fainting, wounds, dislocations, tears, fractures, that rainbow of ailments that ranges from blood red to faded green passing through purples and whites and purples, was continually read by the knowledge of tradition, and there were the virtues of herbs and barks, of beneficial juices and sulfuric waters, the omnipotent powers of lemon and honey, of aromas and ointments, of moonlit waters and liqueurs of leaves and fruits, of punctures and suction cups and incense burners and fasts and tonics and frictions, the infinite resources of memory, improvisation, and hope, to restore the afflicted flesh to the games of the world. Of course, many times the second and fourth horsemen of the apocalypse passed by devastating life and terribly plundering nations, of course death was never defeated, but I dare to think that normally the main dangers of the species were wars and religions, princes and priests, before plagues and diseases. And today we can see that certain epidemics, such as cholera, are consequences of poverty and social disorder rather than mere outbreaks of human morbidity. With an ancient mixture of herbs and tenderness, countless generations were cured of many minor and sometimes major ills. The reason for this, today's naturopathic doctors, and those who cordially prescribe placebos, would tell us, is that the main remedy for the body's ills has always been in the body, in its ability to react and resist, in the body which, as Skopenhauer thought, is a manifestation of the will, in the body and in that fog of dreams that permeates it and that we call the soul. Even many times what sorcerers and doctors did was to enhance with their influence those reserves of enthusiasm, 
that miraculous will to live that is the true nucleus of all existence. Changing the attitude of one's body and consciousness towards the disease can be the beginning of healing. Such must always have been the basis, both illusory and practical, of many miracles. But such wisdom seems to be the privilege of simplicity and ignorance, and in the world that came to touch us, reason triumphed. With the gods dead or absent, man was left alone, distrusting all transcendent order, ignoring everything that was not evident to him, even denying the existence of his own spirit, and trusting only in the virtues of knowledge, reason, and work. Human. Modern positivism, excluding everything that is outside reason and its methods, everything that cannot be logically proven, has reduced man to the poor dimensions of materiality and evidence, and is the desecrated expression of a world made only of blind matter, a cold mechanism governed by inflexible and imperturbable laws where they're no longer fit as active powers, as efficient causes of reality, neither passion, nor hope, nor dreams, nor faith, nor beauty, nor taking refuge in the divine of the world. Something like this had happened, very briefly, in the last days of the Roman Empire. Flaubert wrote that in those times, with the pagan gods dead and Christ not yet triumphant, man was alone in a world without transcendental meaning. Such was the age of Hadrian. That is why when your Sinar writes about that emperor, he seems to be talking about our time, since we too live in an age in which the gods are absent, in which the very sense of the divine has been lost. And that is why Hadrian's doctors are no longer priests or augurs, magicians or miracle workers, they are not those sages capable of seeing in a human being the complex fabric of functions and dreams, languages and inventions that constitute it, but physicists who only see a sad amalgam of lymph and blood. Faced with that gaze that has reduced reality to the functional and the obvious, faced with the terrible gaze of positivism, it is difficult to continue being an emperor, and it is also difficult to preserve the quality of man. Hardly anyone in our time has preserved it. Under the cold, dispassionate, impartial gaze of science, we are only mortal flesh altered by disease or already trapped by the inexorable jaws. It matters little whether the doctor is more or less cordial, more or less compassionate, the mental universe to which he belongs is that of fatal atoms and in that realm there is no room for the magic of hope, nor the mountains of faith, nor the miracle disorders. I remember Yuri Gagarin amazingly declaring that he had gone into outer space and found that God was not there. This is how Marxist positivism wanted to dissolve forever the illusion of divinity, as if the spectacle of starships were necessary, as if we did not know that the pontiffs of positivism and their writers have not been able to perceive the divine in the world either. If we want to know what man is for positivism, it is enough to look at the bacteriological tests, the liver charts, the glycemia curves, the electrocardiograms, the words are as terrible as what they describe the electroencephalograms. All that remains in us is quantifiable matter, measurable space, the helpless tissue of cells, the vertiginous abyss of atoms, identical to the vertiginous abyss of the stars where the naive and obedient cosmonaut could not see God. Nothing seems to remain in us of the sacred fire that blazes in the words of Buddha or Christ, nothing of the mighty myths that were once our substance. A scheme of calcium covered with tissues and liquids, a structure of processes and functions where everything inexplicable is silenced. We believed that the universe was a magical choir of stars proclaiming, as Dante thought, the love that moves them, but the sages have come to tell us that it is nothing more than an abyss of solitude and vertigo, that infinity without meaning whose silence terrified Pascal. We believed that the world was an orb of powers and gods, a tragic garden for beauty and song, but someone has come to tell us that there is only blind matter without a soul, that there is no divinity in the woods or sacredness in the waters, that everything that advanced in beauty like Byron's night can be transformed into rubbish and debris, that the, the mark of the unfathomable gods has been erased from things and now only the mark of the industry can be on them, the greedy logos that have taken over the mystery of the world. We had repeated with Hamlet, what a masterpiece is man. How noble for his reason. How infinite in faculties. In its form and movement how expressive and wonderful. In his actions, 
how like an angel. In his intelligence, how like a god. The wonder of the world. The archetype of beings, but the wise come to show us the finished and complete image of our being, what science could see in us through its most powerful rays and it is nothing more than that scheme of shadows and bones that our X-rays exhibit. But then, where are the dream and the love, the generosity and the hope, the soul full of gods and the flesh full of memories? Does none of that matter or exist? Does none of that count when we face the world, our loneliness, the mysteries of illness, the majesty of death? In what a curious way the spirit of this age proceeds. In all fields, man loses control over his world, creates less and decides less, while the version spreads that we were never more perfect, more important, and happier. While the sermon of supremacy is preached to us, the gospel of comfort, the exaltation of the human being in the ultimate goal of all evolutions and all progress, what we see is the progressive loss of the space of each human being. Already the only trips are the prefabricated and conventional itineraries of tourism, there is no longer anything of reality that does not tend to become merchandise, we are no longer even the protagonists of our own lives, those who want to know what happened yesterday do not question their personal memory, but rather the news and newspapers. On the anonymity, loneliness and undervaluation of millions and millions of unique beings, as mysterious and deadly as any, floats an artificial cloud of celebrities manufactured by the industry, by advertising and journalism, to lavish their anecdotes and sell them as entertainment. And politicians and statesmen are part of that troop of successful faces that is sold to us endlessly, we must also choose them for the wedge, for the profile and the smile. But from all the orders of reality we beat ourselves in retreat. Where the Renaissance left us the illusion of universal men, interested in earth and water, air and fire, curious about the infinite diversity of creatures, forms, and disciplines, now comes the severe throng of specialists and each proceeds to expel us from their plot. The refined modern world does not support vain speculators on all things, whoever wants to survive, compete in his science, make it profitable, must continually circumscribe his field, and know more and more about less and less things. What we did not imagine is that this curious process of eviction of man from everything that previously gave his life meaning, this process by which capital expels us from all the places that were our kingdom for free to make us pay for everything, for love, for friendship, for the world, for the stars, for water and air, would lead us to the alarming and extreme case, that of being expelled from ourselves and from all knowledge about our own substance. Science declared illegitimate and unsubstantiated all the knowledge that tradition had bequeathed us about our body, confined it to the territory of superstition, and established itself as the sole owner of valid knowledge about health and disease, about life and death. Once this task was completed, the technification of diagnostic mechanisms came. Where previously basic knowledge of physiology was sufficient to identify a common dysfunction or condition, more sophisticated equipment and more refined procedures became necessary. Are diagnoses really more accurate? Possibly, but what is certain is that they are more expensive. And who is not willing to invest in certainties when it comes to the most important thing, health? Didn't Skopenhauer write that happiness is health? Everything must be, therefore, subordinated to its obtaining or its conservation. And curiously, it matters little that more than half of human beings are fatally excluded from the enjoyment of these benefits that are proclaimed indispensable, due to poverty, in an absolute way. However, there are already sensible doctors who affirm that this complex apparatus of tests and analyzes and techniques does not always supply the wisdom of a good doctor of those who know how to look at the body as an organic, interdependent and sensitive whole, in which the fear and excitement and hope there are already sensible beings who suspect that it is not always wisdom that dictates these refinements, but rather the greed of capital, which has found in the afflictions of the flesh another of its many fields of action, an immense market. If health is the most precious, why should it be cheap? If the human being can pay taxes, and does so gladly by the ways of Hippocrates, how can he deprive himself of it? Over this formerly venerable field, too, ominous clouds now hang. 
nobody ignores that health is already a commodity. That not only are diagnostic mechanisms expensive, but that pharmaceutical laboratories are vast industrial emporiums, capitalist companies as interested in profit as the others, companies, even, interested in expanding and increasing consumption. Is it not claimed that the producers of Alka-Seltzer obtained a not inconsiderable doubling of their sales by the ingenious device of advertising not one but two effervescent tablets in the same glass of water? Whether or not it happened, the fact is perfectly possible. And we must not forget either that the virtuous pharmaceutical industries are often dependencies of large companies that produce insecticides and other chemical pests. The angels of good have unexpected golden horns. The old alchemy also knows how to distill its poisons. I remember that Ecobedo Cardinal, in one of his poems derived from the teaching of Ezra Pound, says that there are companies that today sell themselves as the jealous guardians of man's salvation, and that at other times have been less kind, like a certain producer of condoms that also manufactured another synthetic substance, napalm. The most important thing is that we no longer know very well where the friends of the human race are. The industry, so generous at times in pleasant and useful things, is completely blind at heart when it comes to making its decisions. It does good and evil with the same amazing intensity, because the only thing that governs it is the mysterious eagerness of capital that, like cancer, only knows how to grow and proliferate at the expense of the organism that nourishes it. Already ignorant and unconscious of our own body, already at the mercy of technicians and industry, history did not want us to see the process of our alienation stop there. What can happen when man is left defenseless in the hands of knowledge and technology, when the possibility of survival becomes, thanks to progress, something so onerous that it ends up being unthinkable. At that point, the serpent of modernity seemed to have bitten its own tail, to have created a vicious circle of need and helplessness in disconcerted humanity, ancient heir to the curse of pain and death. At the time of illness, no one was the owner of knowledge, but the costs of knowledge made it inaccessible. Thus we arrive at the perfection of the system, which consists in every human being paying from the beginning and forever for the health he thinks he will enjoy in the world. Everyone, sick or healthy, must pay tribute month after month to the universal coffers of knowledge that one day will snatch them from the gluttonous jaws of death while saving them from ruin, since these increasingly expensive and specialized doctors, these diagnoses increasingly technical and exhaustive, those increasingly aseptic and prodigious operating rooms, those hospitals, increasingly comfortable and onerous, and those priceless medicines, would cost the eyes of the face or a lifetime. Mortgage to the creditors. For this, it is important that man becomes continuously aware of his fragility and vulnerability. It is a good thing that sudden revelations of possible evil lurk in the pages of magazines, that the disease is always suspended like the famous sword on the neck of mortals, and that they depend on their prepaid insurance card as before they depended on divine mercy. But while the disease must be a continuous and insidious threat, the truth is that it must never arrive. Not because the industry especially appreciates men's health, but because continued health is a condition for productivity. Thus, the disease is abominable only because it paralyzes the payroll, no one should get sick, since their work awaits them, and it is also aggressive that an employee gets sick on work days having two long weeks of vacation a year for it. This zeal to prevent the arrival of the disease is manifest in those advertising spots that always begin by saying, at the first sign of cold or flu, take this or that. Thus, the disease is continuously being rejected or postponed, and erected in the supreme expression of the abnormal and the undesirable but perhaps there are some things that could be said in favor of the disease. Not only that it is more normal than this sick civilization pretends, not only that denying it, drowning it, and fleeing from it is not the best way to deal with it, but that it is part of the mysterious sky of life and usually teaches us things that health does not. Might. From the outset, if health is time for the world, illness may well be time for man, for introspection, recollection, a return to the mysteries of the body, to its relationship with the natural universe. The habit of doctors to keep the secret of the illness they recognize and cure, 
of prescribing us substances that we must consume in the silence of complicit and submissive ignorance, makes us live far from our own body and some of its most disturbing manifestations. Why does modern civilization want us to live behind our deepest certainties? Why does the certainty of death not have a place in the order of our world? Why is disease handled in this double condition of continuous danger and continuous confinement, as a threatening state that must never arrive and against which the army of medicine and its industries rise up endlessly? One answer is that it is somehow true that the truth sets us free. The certainty of death is so difficult to bear that for more than 2,000 years we prefer to dream of the risk of an eternity of suffering rather than admit the possibility of death. The vertiginous and unsustainable idea of an eternal life, in monotonous choirs that never end or in equally long-lasting pestilent furnaces, seemed more pleasant and more pious to us. But also in our melancholy age of triviality and rubbish, of positivism and health by installments, of soulless matter and rapid progress towards the worse, also in this age the wise have been able to show us that, without detriment to the gifts of life, of its splendor and its ineffable miracles, death can also be a blessing for man. Death, with its uncertainties and its mythologies, with its thick layers of shadows and abysses, with its promise of indifference and oblivion, with its rivers that erase memory and its unpredictable drift from the temporal to the eternal, with its dense, solitary, ineluctable, and almost superhuman mystery. But accepting that we are going towards that irreversible door imposes happiness on us as a condition of life. No one who serenely accepts death as a certainty is now in a position to allow his life to be a servile offering in the coffers of greed, a trivial figure in the troops of a cruel and stupid world. The certainty of death, with the tragic aura that it puts on every minute of our lives, makes the rushing spectacle of the world something so dazzling and valuable, filled with so much supernatural horror of cruelty and its crimes, filled with so much nobility the beautiful and the generosity of human existence, puts so much respectful silence where there was so much presumptuous knowledge, diminishes our arrogance so much and magnifies so much our joy, that it no longer allows us to live as slaves to the farces of the world, to be indifferent witnesses of the suffering of living beings, to be only frantic buyers of illustrious rubbish or stunned consumers of nondescript spectacles. That arduous truth, the certainty of pain, expiration, and the end, can make us braver and freer, can allow us to participate in the world's party without the clumsy arrogance of those who believe it is eternal, with the lucid detachment of those who know that he everything is promised to nothing. Only in this way do health and illness, the dignity of life and the majesty of death take on a transcendental meaning. Only in this way the examples of history, myths, and music and symbols, the inexplicable nature, the miracle of the arts and the power of the elements, the tapestry of dreams and the abyss of memory, the soul full of gods and the meat full of memories, will make us raise our voices against the poverty of a world that wanted to simplify us in only obvious matter and accounting processes. We will remember that capital, and the sciences and techniques that serve it, transformed human life into something that is dependent on industry, something that had to work well for strict economic reasons. We will remember this time when, when close to death, man became a disposable terminal organism, useless for capital and already meaningless for science, just where man, alive and sacred until the last moment, is perhaps more lucid and perhaps more full of poignant glimpses. We will understand that another is life and another is death that were promised to us, and that even if these forms of human dignity and nobility never arrive, nothing, not even the icy gaze of the basilisk, will be able to strip us of our hope. The Metropolis Shipwreck Many modern movies, especially American ones, play the strangely suggestive game of weaving variations on the decline and fall of the great cities of the time. One of them, more notable for its theme than for its aesthetic scope, shows a dilapidated New York abandoned to hoodlums and rats, and I seem to recall the broken and toppled head of the Statue of Liberty half-submerged in rubble. Metropolis, Blade Runner, Brazil, are examples of a gloomy look at the future of cities. But more and more we have the feeling that these phantasmagoria of cinema or literature are not idle whims but premonitions and, sometimes, even mirrors of reality. In the violent streets of the Bronx, 
in the melancholic buildings of the Parisian Banlieu, in the ring roads that surround Florence, in the communes of Medellin or on the high rooftops of downtown Sao Paulo, one can already feel that cities are not plus the crowns of civilization, but growing and heartless mazes where anguish and tedium alternate, where perhaps even more undesirable monsters are gestated. The city was, however, our pride and one of our highest dreams. It seemed to be traced in the hearts of men long before the first pyramids, it seemed the essential vocation of the human anthropophysae politi conzoan, a upsilon theta rho omega pi omicron zeta phi sigma epsilon iota xi omega omicron upsilon pi omicron lambda iota tau iota upsilon, Aristotle had written, and this could only mean that man is by his nature an urban living, an inhabitant of the polis. There Rousseau with his fantastic theory that humans were conceivable in the bosom of a happy nature, uncontaminated by culture, everything came to show us that culture is the natural environment of man and that outside of it we are only especially defenseless creatures, alarmingly diminished instincts. We may have lived for centuries in the meadows of Arcadia, on farms, or in cabins in the woods, but history was centered and governed by cities. In these tropics almost all of us are children and grandchildren of peasants, of industrious and elemental beings who struggled their entire lives with the mountains and rivers, of men for whom the wild fields were the universe, but since we were children we know that antiquity was ruled by vast cities. Before our grandparents scrapped the mountains of America, our great-grandparents had lived in Madrid or Seville, in the beautiful cities of Anahuac or in the severe stone-walled Andean peaks, and before that they had traveled from Paris and Santiago and Aachen and Mainz and Rome, they had besieged Istanbul, and they had seen the blue mosques of Baghdad. And before those modernities, when Allah had not yet blossomed on the parched lips of the Prophet, Rome had reigned under the eternal stars, and had raised Carthage, and had paved the roads, uniting London with the capital of Byzantium, Italica. With the cities of Cappadocia and Bithynia, and all this was nothing more than an echo of the cities that Alexander had founded on his incredible journey, the Alexandrias and even the Bucephalias that he had erected for his gods, or of the amazing cities that he found and demolished, such as Thebes or Tyre, which he found and loved, like Ecbatana or Susa, which he found and flung up into heaven, like Persepolis. And behind were still Memphis and Babylon, and that or which he first read in the stars, and the sky held by the Caradatids of Athens, and the high walls of Troy over which the mighty wind blew, and the dim borders of Nineveh. The great cities were as old as the will and as the power over fire. In them the princes had reigned and the favorites had sung and the bureaucracies had prospered, the generals had fought, the priests conspired, the eunuchs intrigued and the slaves received the scorn. Everything human existed by them and for them. The city was like an ideal projection of man, his provision in the markets, his health in the gymnasiums, his courage in the barracks, his pain in the hospitals, his power in the palaces, his eloquence in the agoras, his spirit in the theaters, his veneration in the temples, his conclusion in the cemeteries, its balance in the courts, its unreason in the sanatoriums, its rebellion in the prisons, its supremacy on the thrones, its defeat in the ergastulas. The distribution of the cities was the revelation of the type of social order to which they had agreed, their architecture revealed the secrets of their spirit. Curious about nature, like the pagan cities, or fearful of it, like the Christian cities, with architectures raised to intimidate, like that of the Palace of Versailles, or to seduce like that of the Alhambra, the urban world was full of possible games, of possible dreams, and while the confidence in the destiny of the species lasted, the cities were mechanisms of beauty, monuments to the knowledge of man, to his talent, to his pride, thoughtful works of art. Someone will say that from the most remote times there is also ugliness, dirt, garbage, poverty, debris of war and injustice, corners of pests and pestilence. It does not seem deniable, but before the 18th century the world was wide and diverse, it belonged more to men, and even slaves had a certain margin of singularity. Captured by pirates in Mediterranean waters and sold into slavery in Crete, Diogenes the Cynic not only got his auctioneer to let him hawk himself, 
but spent the entire afternoon asking passers-by who was sensible enough to buy himself a master. It is fame that it found a buyer. The city was the great dream of the species, and the different utopias in which human dissatisfaction knew how to indulge, weaved fantastic cities governed by philosophers or by angels, ordered according to the algebras of reason or the imperatives of divinity. The city of God, the city of the philosopher king, the Spartan city of the warrior, the fabulous cities of Marco Polo, the fantastic Babylon of Voltaire, the ideal Rome of Piranesi, the city jumped from reality to fantasy, there was no sage who did not dream of a perfect city, subject to an evident or tacit divinity, an Athens consecrated to knowledge, a Jupiterian Rome consecrated to power and law, a Venusian Laetitia consecrated to the pleasure and love, an Apollonian Florence consecrated to the arts, a Sibaris consecrated to the art of living, a Sodom consecrated to voluptuousness, a Baghdad, or an Alexandria consecrated to knowledge, Georges of abundance, Capuas of delight, buried Atlantis of the golden centuries. But it seems that from a certain moment the cities of the imagination began to darken, not only to resemble the worst of the real cities but to magnify it especially. The vision of poverty suggested infinite neighborhoods of helplessness and indifference. The rise of machines, vast factory districts overwhelmed by smoke and rust. The rise of manufacturing, endless shops. In that disappearance of splendid fantasies was encrypted the loss of faith of men in the possibilities of the city and also the death or flight of the divinities who were its center and its spirit. Suddenly we were thrown into what is now called the royal city. It is in Baudelaire's poems, it is a swarming metropolis tyrannized by work and boredom, where the spirit must take refuge in the artificial paradises of absinthe and opium. It is in the novels of Dickens, where lonely and battered human beings survive the adversity of a world both populous and empty. It is in Balzac's novels, where bourgeois society eats and works and has fun, already stripped of all idealism, moved by the sole force of profit. It is in Dostoevsky and Henry James, and it advances darkening towards ruthless urban mechanisms in which man is a foreigner and is forever lost, the city of Franz Kafka's stories and novels. With the arrival of our century, the city seemed to reach its limit. On June 16, 1904, two almost imaginary beings, a young poet named Stephen Dedalus and a 50-year-old merchant named Leopold Bloom, walked for the last time through the rubble of the ideal city of philosophers and dreamers, and for the first time walked through the exhausting labyrinth of the prosaic city, stripped of sacredness, the cold universe without gods of the modern city, crowds and trams, countless unknown destinations, simultaneous and parallel, the physical space motley with buildings and shops on a sub-background of tunnels and pipes, the obscene entrails of the city that delivers its dark detritus to the blind immensity of the seas. At that moment the process of what is usually called modernity was consummated, since then, the European soul and that of many of its children all over the planet have not been able to escape that world that Joyce captured with splendid and almost superhuman clairvoyance. Since then, almost all the cities of Western literature have corresponded to this detailed plan of the spiritual Dublin of 1904, the ghostly London of Chesterton, the detailed and lavish world of Proust, the Manhattan of John Dos Passos, the almost intolerable Berlin of Alfred Doblin. Almost all the cities dreamed up by science fiction also correspond to this scheme, the absolute cities of Ballard, the stellar cities of Frederick Pohl, the mysterious neighborhoods of Bradbury, the city of Philip K. Dick that Ridley Scott made us amazingly visible. Beneath those clouds of light and symbols of the imagination, real cities have grown. And they do not differ much from their illustrious imaginary replicas. Mexico tends to be the infinite city. London and Los Angeles spread out in the night like phosphorescent spots on the earth, the towering towers of Manhattan, Chicago, and Sao Paulo invade the sky, Lagos and Buenos Aires expand at the mouth of their enormous rivers, the slums, full of uncertainty and violence, they shock the daily life of Rio de Janeiro and Bogota, and nowhere do they seem to stop growing with them the evils of the city already stripped of its magical aura, already converted into a chaos of violence and noise. 
It is true that many European cities and some American cities still maintain a certain balance that is the result of centuries of slow growth, foresight, discipline, pedagogy of coexistence and emphasis on civic ethics. It is true that even in Paris and Boston car drivers do not aggressively launch themselves against pedestrians, it is true that in many cities there is an elementary respect for the rules of coexistence in a motley world. It is true that, on the other hand, the confused Latin American cities seem to show all the disadvantages of urban life and none of its age-old virtues. It is true that the inhabitants of Vienna and Madrid survive better than the trapped inhabitants of the cities of Latin America. But the reason is that Mexico, Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, Caracas, and Bogota have grown to their disproportionate proportions today in little more than half a century, they have seen their population multiply by 10 or 20 in that period, they have not always reached to adapt their colonial streets to the invasion of the noisy and fast machines that civilization brought us, and they have been the first and pathetic victims of that desperate and urgent thing that the wise call progress and with which no one seems to be dissatisfied in the streets. Hegemonic capitals of the world. But there is already so much worship for matter that there is no room left for the spirit, there is already so much information that there is little room for knowledge and yet so much knowledge that there is no room left for wisdom. In such a hurry, we forgot where we were going, with so much work, we forgot that we were working for a better life, with so much consumption we forgot that it was important to be something and to be someone, with so much passivity and so much spectacle, we forget that it was the ability to create that made us human. The last will be the first. These nations, which were the last to receive the legacy and the imperative of Western civilization, will never reach the plenitude that Europe experienced, or a European elite, in the 18th century, but they are already the first to suffer from the disorders and evils that the, the very idea of the city was kept in its bosom, and the evils with which history was enriching it. What is it that has made our cities grow so enormously? It is true that general population growth has meant that today there are almost as many living beings as there have been since the beginning of history. It could be said that the number of the living and the number of the dead of all ages have been balanced, and thus form an amazing equation that will not fail to be stimulating for the symbol hunters and the augurs of modernity. But humanity could very well still be spread over the surface of the continents, cultivating the land in a reasonable way, taking care not to plunder or plunder the sacred universe that is the very condition of our existence. The species could be organized in semi-rural communities, educated, industrious, worshippers of ethics and aesthetics, respectful of nature, vigorous, emotionally healthy, free from prejudice and austere, in which the greatest cultural diversity imaginable could flourish, and even take advantage of the beneficial possibilities of science and technology, and the planet would not even feel that there are humans on it. But everything has fallen into the hands of forces that have no interest in the conservation of the planet, that cannot be moved by the deterioration of human and natural life, that cannot feel the sacred or the divine of the world because of the sad and powerful reason that they cannot even feel, they are the immense corporations that today govern everything, heiresses of the arrogance of the warriors, of the haughtiness of the pontiffs, of the selfishness of the monarchs. Its objective is one, to turn the world and hopefully the universe into a huge market, and human beings, including their own alienated administrators, into dispossessed producers who are no longer owners even of their own arms, of their own minutes, and into passive consumers of all things. These active and ungovernable forces that produce and accumulate, need a concentrated and available humanity on which to exert their influence and to which to provide. As long as power was in the hands of warriors, kings, or pontiffs, humanity could be dispersed, divided into nations or tribes hostile to each other. But as the masters are unified throughout the planet, the subjects are also being unified, diversity becomes a hindrance and cities become symbols that offer the crowds the lure of happiness, comfort, a prosperous and secure life. That is why cities, in their old communal, intellectual, and artistic sense, disappear from reality and dreams alike, and are being replaced by the city of supermarkets and cars, of massive shows, of newspapers, and television. Of prepaid insurance and incessant banks and credit cards. 
where there is abundance and the schemes of democracy work, that model may work for some time. A humanity stripped of all initiative will base its existence on the duty of joining the massive rituals of work and consumption, will obediently pay its dues, will improve its car every year, will pay its house to the end, he will enjoy the health insurance that continually saves him from the ruin of an increasingly costly disease, he will work all day in the office or in the factory, he will cook his own food less and less, he will sit every morning in front of the newspaper that exempts him from being the protagonist of his own life, he will sit every night in front of the television that endlessly fills hours that would be dangerously empty, he will watch television in all his free hours or go shopping compulsively in the incessant shops, taking advantage of all offers that make you feel like you're doing a good deal even though you don't need the product, and you'll go on vacation to repeat a ritual that nothing teaches or transforms anymore. And these things he will call, with more or less enthusiasm, his happiness. But the same scheme projected on the other societies of the planet will produce different effects. The cities of the so-called third world also radiate their dreams of happiness. They offer immigrants harassed by dispossession, by rural violence, by poverty, the hope of work, of security, of prosperity. In the city there is the progress, the factories, the supermarkets, the warehouses, the medical attention at all hours, the ATMs, the celebrities, the cinema, the big shows, the real life. Who wants to remain in the poverty of small plots, in their dark and helpless nights where pain is all-powerful, where insecurity is total, where nature, as Hegel thought, is infinitely repetitive and tedious. The city is action, speed, animation, company, the city is cheerful, modern, full of seductions, fashions, adventures. In its corners can await wealth, love, surprise, the sudden possibility of a different life. The city is so powerful, it throws its tempting message drunk with promises onto the outside world with all the languages of technology, that one should rather be amazed that they remain poor in the fields and in the towns. But evidently the city cannot fulfill those beautiful promises. It cannot occupy all the people who arrive, it cannot offer them a pleasant house in a peaceful neighborhood, and there are other surprises that it has on the corners for the dazzled travelers. Then the slums grow endlessly, insecurity grows in the streets because the legitimate duty of those who lack everything and have no protection from society is to survive like the wolf in the steppe. Dissatisfaction grows due to much desire and little achievement, when reality does not make accessible the many things that television screens proclaim as essential goods and as mandatory happiness the swarm becomes spiteful or at least bitter. We are in the heart of the promised land and yet we have never been so far from paradise. Every day brings a disappointment, but the promises continue flashing intact, and there is no longer any will to oppose them or arguments with which to evade them. Although reality shows over and over again that the dream is impossible, the promise of the city is irrefutable, ineluctable. As in the game, even if we have lost everything, the next game is always the promise of a final triumph, which injustice must come and will compensate all the efforts, all the failures. But the mysterious power of this formidable illusion may have its source in deeper regions. We tend to think of the world's problems as isolated, unconnected and substantive ills, although everything leads us to suspect that they form an organic part of a whole. The huge city, the concentration of humans and creatures that have united their destiny, also means separating from nature and building a perfectly controlled orb, where the margin of chance and risk tends to be computable to zero. I would say that the temptation of the absolute city is the daughter of the idea that man does not belong to the natural order, of the illusion that man is superior, and of the feeling that nature is dangerous or evil. The idea of superiority is the easiest of human mistakes and it is perfectly understandable that for millennia we have made it our certainty and our pride. Gradually we made the gods human, so that it would not hurt that the universe had been created by a power of which we are the image and likeness. This gave us certain divine privileges that the rest of creation did not share. Everything had to be subject to us, for us the Nile of time endlessly paid tribute to its silt and its treasures. And the human city would be the visible head of the universe, 
the throne of power and wisdom of which we would be representatives and administrators. Already that phase was onerous for the world. In our capacity as priests and spokesmen for despotic divinities, we were able to cause serious damage, and the only thing that sometimes protected nature was the admission that she, too, had divine attributes. But the triumph of Christianity definitively removed nature from its sacredness. For the Greeks there were divinities in the water, in the air, in the accumulation of clouds and in the passage of time, in the blossoming of lilies, in illness and in death. For Christianity, only through the human was the divine manifested, and the enemies of man were the devil, the world, and the flesh, three powers that the pagans had exalted in the form of Dionysius, Zeus, and Aphrodite. But what to expect from that gaze on nature? If the Old Testament reveals it, we can understand the walls it erected against it. Almost every mention of nature in the sacred book is charged with a moral judgment, it is the tree of knowledge, the serpent that is the devil, the apple that is sin, the burning bush in which God speaks, the rain that it is the deluge, which is divine punishment, the rainbow which is the text of the covenant, frogs, locusts, river waters, night shadow, become the plagues that afflict Egypt. And if to this was added, to form imperial Christianity, Platonic spiritualism, it is understandable that nature has been secularly excluded and has become something undesirable and terrible. At the end of the Middle Ages, a man as lucid and universal as Dante was able to oppose the image of the city, a symbol of culture and moral order, with a dark jungle that represents horror and chaos. I would say that everything in Christianity, except for the inexplicable and inspired figure of Francis of Assisi, was hostile to nature, and served as the foundation for an exclusive civilization, and an arrogant anthropocentrism in which, however, the most primitive and perhaps the most essential forces of man. There is a moving episode in Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra that can enlighten us about the drama of the modern city. It is night in the Roman camp, on the eve of the final battle. The army sleeps, but in front of the general's tent two sentinels keep watch. Suddenly a great noise rises in the shadows. It is a music of oboes under the earth, as if a great procession were getting underway, the noise fills the air, but everything remains immobile and unchanged. First only the two sentinels hear him, then all the soldiers. One of them asks the other what noise is that, what could all that mean? And the other answers, it is the god Hercules, who loved Antonio and now abandons him. Although Swedenborg thought he knew it, no one can tell us the exact date when the sense of the divine left our world. The truth is that all of us were born into a universe already stripped of sacredness. And curiously, that impoverished world was not more defenseless but more arrogant. The city was never so proud and imposing as when it was stripped of gods. Everything was empty of meaning but also of limits, man was alone and owned the world, absolute master of mountains and jungles, the bottom of the sea and outer space. It was never so evident that the Promethean powers had passed into our hands, that matter was docile to the dreams of reason. Now there would be no restrictions, nothing would stop progress, the whole planet would abide by the law of man, and very soon in the high abysses the text of human supremacy would be read. Two centuries have passed since the French revolutionaries established the cult of reason, shortly after promulgating the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Two centuries of loneliness and supremacy have passed, and today we can see the result. The entire ancient and untouched universe begins to show the injuries, some perhaps incurable, that our blindness has inflicted on it. The indiscriminate plundering of nature, considered as a bank of resources, confronts us with the danger of the disappearance of forests and jungles, and with them of the planetary air. Industrial waste and toxic fumes have already perforated the atmospheric layer. The frenzy of performance no longer allows the slow maturation of beings and trades, humanity is beginning to resemble those hatcheries where birds or fish are subjected to the pressure of growth so that they develop at the pace of the need for capital. Projecting uniform spectacles for all men, modernity unifies and confuses the sexes, the ages, the cultures, in a single undifferentiated amalgam, devoid of nuances and meanings. 
we had been taught that each human being was unique and precious before the powers of the unknown. Now only the quantifiable remains and we are all the same, an insignificant being made of mortal matter, that nothing should create, that no singular truth should embody, that should only produce and consume according to the unappealable dictates of industry and its servile assistance. Science and Technology Due to an admirable paradox, the triumph of man, proud of his cosmic loneliness, looks too much like the defeat of man, and already threatens to be the even more deplorable defeat of life, of the sublime adventure that could be called universal history. And the cities, which were once our pride, and one of our highest dreams, the crowns of civilization, the kingdom of friendship and imagination, have become the stage where a humanity stripped of meaning and duties, blind to the fate of his mysterious planet, he unknowingly enacts the drama of its decline, the shipwreck of Metropolis, and pathetically ignores what will be the next episode of the threatening work, and if that episode will not be the last. Perhaps the forecasts of the prophets of science fiction will be fulfilled. Perhaps the atomic hangars will give an account of a fragile humanity crowded into immense urban colonies, or the population bomb will turn humans into crazed termites that annihilate themselves, or rivers of cars and indiscriminate industry and indestructible plastic nightmares and unmanageable garbage will turn cities into inhospitable kingdoms of neurosis, speed, and disorder, or maybe one day humanity, desperate from itself, from its traffic congestion, from its industrial frenzy, fed up. With publicity, terrified of insecurity, deaf of roar, will remember that immense fields exist and will once again find the path of a slow life and sensible, or perhaps a massive desertion of human termite mounds will bring terror to the countryside as it sometimes brought it to the city. None of these alternatives is more likely than the others. But I believe that only the recovery of the sacred meaning of the world, only the return unpredictable in its expressions, its ethics, and its aesthetics of the divine, will be able to allow humanity to recover its discreet and sublime place in the order of the universe, will be able to allow the reconciliation of man with nature, the passage from the time of domination to the time of alliance, and may allow the idea of the city, order, beauty, and spirit, to recover the humble and sacred meaning it had, before becoming nightmare. The duties of Latin America. Ever, with his classic humor made of lucidity and paradoxes, Jorge Luis Borges affirmed that perhaps the only true Europeans were us, the Latin Americans, who see Europe as a totality of which we feel heirs, while no one in Europe feels European but just Spanish or French, Swedish or German. We could add that hardly anyone feels Spanish, but Catalan, or Basque, or Galician, that the Serbs feel not of another race but of another planet than the Croats, that in Italy, a country once made up of numerous republics, dialects abound, that to be Irish is obviously not to be English. Our America has persisted in the non-dialectal use of the Castilian language, contributed by one of the many members of its complex racial and cultural mix, in such a way that a man from Cuernavaca or Tegucigalpa can understand each other over coffee with one from Columbus, from Caracas, Cali, or Valparaiso and you will only have slight problems in understanding yourself with a Spaniard, whose defect is the lack of universality, not in information, but in attitude. The truth is that we are Europeans, but fortunately we are much more than Europeans. And I say fortunately because even forgetting the cavalcade of blood that our peninsular grandparents staged here, or considering it a normal example of the criminal clumsiness of the human condition, Rome did not do better with Carthage, nor the Aztecs with their neighbors, nor Japan with China, there are other elements in Europe's complex legacy that should be deplored and overcome. One of them is the traditional attribution of superiority to everything that is European. Seeing the order that Europe has built and spread across the planet, that order that North American society has pushed to its limits, I would say that all the legendary virtues of Europe are today under suspicion. Rationalisms have been born from his intelligence. Of his discipline, totalitarianism. Of their patriotism, the day before yesterday Roman arrogance, yesterday Nazi barbarism, today Serbo-Croatian barbarism. From his industriousness, the wasteful industrial warehouse. Of your knowledge, nuclear arsenals. Of his faith, 
the defenestration of Prague, the Thirty Year War, the Holy Inquisition. Of its foresight, the threatening cloud of police states, of manipulative corporations, of genetic warehouses, of unmanageable lethal garbage, of defenseless humanity, that hovers over the planet today. What an injustice to the arts of Europe, to the philosophies of Europe, to the rich European imagination, what a blasphemy against the divine Plato, against the universal Leonardo, against the harmonious Palladius, against the sublime genius of Mozart, against Kant, against Nietzsche, against Louis of Bavaria, to affirm that the most conspicuous and glorious cultural tradition on the planet is under suspicion. What would the world be, they will tell us, without Greek philosophy, without Christianity, without the rumor of the troubadours, without the divine comedy, without the size of Romeo, without the penultimate sonata for cello and piano by Ludwig van Beethoven, without Rembrandt's meditating philosopher, without Brahms' violins, without Cologne Cathedral, without Louis Pasteur, without James Joyce's superhuman labyrinths of music. I have made this list in response to some of the countless things in Europe that, as Borges would say, dictate veneration to my chest and I hasten to say that I sincerely believe that the world would be poorer, more hopeless, and sadder without them. But I hasten to also declare that this cultural excellence is not exclusive to Europe, that the Eurocentrism of Western civilization has led us to appreciate never enough but exclusively the creations of that region of the world, and has subjected us to an astonished servitude. Europe is great and beautiful and talented, but it is no more so than the rest of the world, and if it seems to have been, this is not due to a creative hypertrophy of Europe muted by the surrounding planetary sterility, but to other reasons that are worth worth examining if we want the world to be saved, and with it the exquisite crystal and stone roses and music that our venerable relatives engendered in Europe. One of the greatest virtues of the 20th century has been to teach us to look at what is different with respect. Nationalist barbarities have always been characterized by the pride of ethnic idols and by the simultaneous blindness to the virtues of others. Ultimately, it always seemed beautiful and perfect only what is proper and what is similar. This is strange, because given the constitution of the human being, it would seem rather that he continuously needs the external and the different. But Europe lived centuries upon centuries facing the face of Africa and only Picasso came to discover that there was beauty in the ritual masks of those peoples who heard, farm and hunt beyond the Mediterranean. The reason why Les Demoiselles de Vignon has fascinated our time is because in them the artist knew how to fuse the skills of the Western tradition with the mysteries of that African universe that the Europeans had always had at the forefront, and that they had been able to discover by being busy dealing with him and dominating him. What can one think of a culture that enters the mysterious realms, full of dark sublimity, of the plains of Africa, and instead of bowing down, drunk with curiosity and veneration, dedicates itself to hunting down warriors, overwhelming with chains the maidens and turn the priests into beasts of burden. A part of the ancient history of Europe is yet to be written, and it will not be written by its own historians. I dare to think that in this story Aim Bon Plant will be more important than Napoleon Bonaparte and Baron Alejandro de Humboldt more important than the ineffable Professor Jorge Federico Guillermo Hegel, major trumpeter of European hegemony and idolator of progress. That hegemony is especially familiar to the men of Latin America. From her we learn that here there may be songs and rhythms, funny tunes and curious sound inventions, but that real music, great music, is that controlled storm that the symphony orchestras, their fractional chamber orchestras and their virtuosos spread in funeral uniforms. Soloists. And who can deny that greatness? But under what cover can a single cultural tradition, no matter how colorful and perfumed it may be, take the place of the only language and the only path on a planet as vast and as rich as this one? Do not all these tacit or express impositions resemble the abusive claim of the Roman Church to be the only refuge of the soul, the safe ship outside of which there is no salvation? This tribal vice of excluding or subjugating all that is different is very human, but no one has been able to bring it to its fullness like Europe. Because of him there were medical and Punic, Octavian and Byzantine, Carolingian and Norman wars, because of him there were campaigns against the Albigensians and Dalcinists, 
because of him all the children of the Crusaders were orphaned and later they left their children orphaned, and there were wars of whites and blacks, Guelphs and Ghibellines, Imperatorists and Papists, for him Dante lost his house and Cervantes lost his hand and Quevedo lost his tranquility and Rambo his leg, and poor. Europe in 1914 lost his greatest men. It is necessary in reality, a matter of life or death that these infinite traditions can coexist and even enrich each other reciprocally, without the bloody ethnic idols establishing their exclusions and their hierarchies. For this, it is essential to admit that in matters of art, thought, sensibility and creation without commercial interests, there is no progress, no hierarchies, no possible supremacy. Shakespeare's inexhaustible genius does not surpass Basho or the Arabian Nights. Durer's hand is the same hand of Altamira's guests. The music of the Kunas and the spring of Wolfgang Arnadeus Mozart are fraternal rumors that rise from the mystery of the human condition and ennoble it, and that deserve, like the song of the nightingale, a place under the eternal stars. Our status as colonies meant that for us, for a long time, European culture was the only one worthy of the name, its arts the only arts, the proportions of the Apollo of Olympia and the reflections in marble of Aspasia and Phryne, the only consecrated forms of the beauty. But he also made French gardens, European vegetation, its rivers, its lakes, its particular notion of forests and jungles, become models of superior nature. It's okay, here we had inherited the language, a language is a tradition, and surely the universe that surfaced on our lips did not correspond to the universe that encircled our bodies. That is why Miguel Antonio Caro wrote Eclogues of Virgilio, Almedo Latin Epics, José María Iguerín Wo Verlanian Triolets in Peru, Banch saw impossible nightingales in Argentina, and even Ruben Dario, the Liberator, passed divine Marchioneses through Gautier Woods. Even in this we were a kind of outcasts of Europe, outcast offspring stunned by nostalgia, unable to see the world, unable to be what we were. The Europeans will say that these diseases are ours, that they haven't longed for those Parnassian figureheads for a long time and that they are not imposing the cult of Europe on us. But their mental order is inscribed in the very structure of Western civilization, and no one is unaware that European pride no longer needs to impose itself with cannons and bombs, because it has spent its ammunition on the bodies of the Sioux and notched its swords on the flanks of the Sioux. Aztecs and left the Caribbean smelling of gunpowder and erased the Araucanians. One can also read the rubric of English sabers on the skin of India, and on the pyramids texts written by Roman swords, and one sometimes wonders if the nose of the Sphinx was not blown off by some Napoleonic cannon. European superiority was written in blood and fire on the nations, and the process of recovering our consciousness has been very slow. Joseph Conrad, at the beginning of the century, knew how to show us in Heart of Darkness, the spiritual background of colonialism, the horror that stirs in the heart of that powerful will to dominate that still threatens to erase humanity. But it is good to remember that the proud tribal contempt with which Europe often looks at the world is the same with which Europe looks at itself, that it is not only a danger to others but a danger to itself, that being a German Nazi is not only threatening the human race but first of all the French and the Poles, that to be a French nationalist is not only to hate the African Pied Noirs but the Italians and the Spanish, that these ferocious fundamentalisms are like the sunken warriors of Victor Hugo, who still in the depths bite the logs of their own shipwreck. This narrow-mindedness is not only found in the hatred with which German skinheads kill young Turks, with which French fanatics desecrate Jewish graves, with which many Spaniards regard South Americans, it is in the delight with which Europeans a little further north usually say that Africa begins in the Pyrenees. But this phrase, traditionally considered an aggression, today is more of a compliment. A certain form of the European hegemonic spirit sees something different in Spain, something that does not seem to belong entirely to the European tradition. And it is not especially about poverty, since Greece can be poorer. It is not a question of a lack of traditions, Spain was the largest empire in the world, and saw the birth of several Roman emperors within it. But there is something that keeps Spain closer to the elemental world. I, 
who for a long time saw the lack of Spanish rationalism as a historical defect, now see it as a virtue. It is interesting that Spain has produced not only priests like the rest of Europe but also mystics, beings who, as Estanislao Zolta would say, establish a personal relationship with the divinity and can dispense with the vast priestly bureaucracy. While the rest of Europe advanced towards rationalism, and towards what today is the empire of science, technology, and industry, it happened that simultaneously with the onerous triumph of the Counter-Reformation and the absolute submission to the power of Loyola and the Pope, something in Spain, something necessary and perhaps promised to the future, took refuge in passion, in, loyalty, in hospitality and, if you will, in madness. The arrival of utilitarianism and the kingdom of merchants had buried an age of heroism, of magic, of faith in miracles, of self-sacrifice and detachment. The relationship between sellers and buyers came to attenuate or erase the old miracle of friendship. Friendship, in which there is neither mine nor yours, that passion that does not fit in the universe of the market, is the substance of the book with which the best of the Spanish soul warned of the arrival of the age of greed and deplored and opposed it. To the calculations and securities of reason, the follies and generosities of heroism. Because in the face of the temptation of rationalism, already irrepressible, Spain opposed as a discourse and as symbols foolishness, delirium, fantasy, and friendship, the sublime cavalcade of Sancho and Don Quixote. That is why Spain is and is not European. It is not the country of science but it is the country of the arts. The virtues of its people are not mainly knowledge but ethics. But ethics will be the only door to enter the future and perhaps from our Spanish heritage we will still learn to be without duplicity, to live with a little more passion, with a little more innocence. Does the rest of Europe lack similar virtues? Probably not. But the illustrious virtues on which modernity was founded sustain the hegemonic building of the civilization, have been exalted in the obligatory virtues of humanity, and have made Nietzsche himself assure the species, you will perish for your virtues. It will be up to us to find different virtues and be less proud of them, if we want to get out of the noisy and dazzling labyrinth of industrial society, in whose corners lurks an all-powerful monster with the body of a hydra and an electronic brain whose name has not yet been revealed to us. Today the city, as the West magnified it, frontier of order and chaos, refuge from nature, museum of immobile yesterdays, jewelry box of human inventions, murmuring hive of reason, has become what Miller called a nightmare. Provided with air conditioning, begins to suffocate in its own mephitic mists and knows less and less what to do with its waste and debris. And once again, we are the direct heirs of that tradition who first felt the evils that it brought in its entrails. We see Manhattan from the other bank of the Hudson River and the heart is overwhelmed, amazed at the magnitude of the works of man, who has thus raised that kind of geometric mountain range, that wall whose battlements would like to pierce the heavens in a babble way, and we feel not only her beauty but her fear, her fragility. Didn't Rilke say that the beautiful is nothing more than that form of the terrible that we can still bear? But we look at Mexico City, a prelude to the infinite city, which can hardly look at itself anymore, to Medellin besieged by the violence of the excluded, shocked at night by the gunshots that go deeper, from hill to hill, to Caracas, made for cars, to Rio, where child hunters come out from the shadows, everywhere we see unemployment, poverty, violence, abandonment, and we feel that the heritage of civilization has not been generous with the peoples of this side of the world. With the riches of America, the hegemony of Europe was reinforced, machines and laboratories began to function, thanks to those riches, reason triumphed in the West. But all the virtues of Europe came to us stripped of their friendly mask. The Catholic religion, heart of the ambiguous European humanism, destroying the native gods, abandoned this grandiose nature from American myths, and vainly tried to subject its immensities and its abysses to the illusion of a power with a human face. The language, which only modernism made American, kept us for centuries floating above reality without taking root in it. Even the arts and letters of Europe were shown to us, not as high examples of the human spirit, but as the only channels of culture. Europe was our teacher and our guide, 
but it would also be our judge and our conscience. You had to exhibit in Europe, succeed in Europe, be famous in Europe, deserve the condescension of its scholars, win the Nobel Prize. It was necessary to adopt the universal declaration of the rights of man and of the citizen, establish the division of public powers, implement universal suffrage, think European, breathe European, not invent anything. But behind Santa Barbara, Chang'o continued to encourage, under the ostentatious regulations that make our governments confuse the art of governing with the ridicule of dictating decrees, always bothersome and always useless, the peoples chose the most sensible path of pragmatism, before the infinite snail of the procedures even the officials cheated Carnivales Cayley, faced with the imposition of models that declare us forever inferior, trivial, and barbaric, it is not surprising that these peoples responded with disdain and irreverence. Why am I going to venerate an order that denies me and assigns me the last place in the echelon of the human? Why am I going to venerate a culture, some arts that are offered to me as the heritage of superior beings and before which I am denied the right to express an opinion and even to feel? Treat them as human and they will be human, said Goethe. I believe that the time has come for the men of Latin America to take possession of our world. Let us hear the beautiful words of Rehert Frost. Something that we refused to give wasted our strength, until we understood that that something was ourselves, that we did not give ourselves to the ground in which we lived, and from that moment it was our salvation to give ourselves. Do we know the names of the trees that accompany us on this mysterious adventure? Not until, I think, protect them from the plunder of insatiable industry, it is necessary to know and love them. To know the amazing variety of creatures that are like us, daughters of the territory? Aren't mockingbirds and armadillos, frogs, and butterflies, our responsibility? We already know that man cannot destroy everything without destroying himself, we must also know that man cannot be saved without. Save it all perhaps it will be up to us to change the declaration of the rights of man for a universal declaration of the rights of the world, of which we men are just a small and dangerous fraction. We are, like all the peoples that are and that were, in the center of the world, but it is necessary to be aware of this. And I think it will also be necessary to invent institutions that resemble us. Forget the failed structure of useless states that ask for everything and give nothing in return, that corrupt every heart that surrenders to them, that govern with decrees on statistics and that feel nothing before the prostration, helplessness and agony of millions of humans. Faced with the dangers of totalitarianism, said Borges, perhaps our poor individualism still has a role to play. Aren't all the traditions here, all the races, don't the dreams and desires of the planet converge in our channel? No one like Borges has been able to show us the richness of this border position between the cultural tradition of the West, which belongs to us naturally, the tradition of all the planet, and the mysteries of our being American. He knew how to tell us that the death of a compadrito from Buenos Aires is equivalent to the death of Cesar. He knew how to tell us, evoking Evaristo Carrigo, that our world is as worthy of poetry and history as any other, he told us, remembering Heraclitus of Ephesus, whom some visitors had surprised in the kitchen, come in, let here also are the gods, and he dedicated his entire life, his amazing talent and his profound erudition to showing us that here too reality is in its fullness, that the scene of our life and our death must be dignified, that our poetry must talk about our territory, that here also that unknown and anxious and brief thing, which is life, that here, in any corner of Guayaquil or Valencia, Santiago or Managua, on any shore of the Parana or Orinoco, in any street in Matanzas or Lima, in any hacienda in Magdalena or Chaco, in any tenement in Veracruz, in any basement in Buenos Aires is the Aleph, is the universe. And through him we have also learned the secret of a serene humility, the certainty that everyone who knows what he has, what he will inevitably lose, does not need to resort to imposition. Our only possible greatness will be to identify ourselves with the cause of the world, far from all petty local pride, and not set ourselves up as paradigms of any kind of superiority. Neither wealth, nor knowledge, nor force, 
nor tradition can be instruments to exclude or silence others. Faced with the imperative duty to save, not only the future, today vastly threatened, but everything that already seemed definitive, yesterday, the dead, the myths, even the most minimal and tenuous knowledge of the peoples always silenced and always excluded, it must be heard as the very voice of the gods. It is enough to look at the vital niches of the peoples of Africa and the native peoples of America, magically fused with nature, friends with the forest and the stones, and compare them with these formidable and terrible hives that our pride erected, to understand that there is a eluded wisdom, some keys to inventing the future ignored only because the meek discovered them, because they were not dictated by greed or the will to dominate, but by cordiality, respect, reverence, virtues that, like a certain magical character in our literature, they don't want to be triumphantly right. They are, I repeat, the wisdom of the meek, but despite the nuclear arsenals, the pollution, the armies of technology, the seas of plastic, despite the infinite power that rises like a disastrous cloud on the horizon of civilization, perhaps that man or god who declared that the meek shall inherit the earth was not entirely wrong. Today it is an imperative need to acquire or recover the awareness that the world is vaster and richer than what the unifying troop of capital would have us think. Restored to its true proportion, European culture will let us hear the murmur of other cultures, the music that refuses to impose itself or make itself heard through electronic thunder, the plastic arts that do not feel obliged to go through the increasingly doubtful filter of European and North American galleries, the literatures that do not seek to make their way through the impost tours of advertising and the big market, examples of coexistence between different races and traditions, the study of the innumerable languages and dialects of nations, villages, and tribes that do not try to impose themselves as superior languages, the plurality of religions, the abundance of mythologies, the persistence of legends, and we must redouble our efforts not to fall into the imposing habits of Western tradition. One day we will have said goodbye to that intolerant world of conquerors and evangelizers who are masters of the truth because they are masters of the sword, and who erect their inventions, without admirable evasion, in the exclusive forms of beauty, truth, and well. We can criticize Europe and its inventions because we are Europeans, but above all because we care about their fate. We also carry the legacy of tribal hatred, but here there is such a diversity of races and peoples, of religions and superstitions, miscegenation and malatwasm are so great that after five centuries the rivers of our blood have merged, that hardly those hatreds will be able to prosper. As long as they are not intoxicated with pride and hostility, as long as they do not come out to deny the others, local cultures are a defense against the clumsy uniformity of the planet. The demon of nationalism is also at work here, but the brotherhood of traditions and the common treasure of the language may well serve as an antidote. The truth is that just as in a critical and nostalgic way we are Europeans, we also feel the growing rumor of a continental fraternity barely antagonized by the formalism of the governments and the suspicion of the armies, who rightly fear that the cordiality between the nations a phantasme in decorative or useless bodies. Hate still has a place to take refuge but it is our duty to contribute to the flow of the rich and powerful planetary tradition everything we have and still do not know, everything that, due to Western hegemonic thought, we have not been able to value. The active Europe looked everywhere but we suspect that it did not know how to see much in them. Just as he melted exquisite works of art into ingots, or spent looting sacred tombs to decorate their museums, or destroying temples to take possession of their divine relics, or uprooting the stone trees full of inscriptions that an ancient wisdom knew how to conceive and erect, to take them to be the center of soulless squares, thus reducing to silence or indifference dreams and traditions that are not accidental forms of human inventiveness, but essential secrets of the survival of the species. It remains to be said what the world has so far deprived itself of. What has been silenced by the looting of greed and by the thunder of pride. It is still necessary to say that the peoples who defended themselves to the death have left a cry that waits in the throats of the living. That before the lethal cloud that advances over the world, full of knowledge, power, technology, products, advertising, shows that immobilize man, 
and incomprehensible atomic arsenals, before that lavish and admirable power that denies the sacred and plunders nature and everything profane, we only have one power to oppose, the last asylum of hope, the power of the divine that awaits, in the form of dreams and legends, friendship and love, art and memory, of perplexity and gratitude, in the hearts of human beings, that force that will never appear in any statistics, that therefore does not seem to exist or count before the evident powers of chaos, but that is the one that built nations, invented the languages, polished the trades and knew how to raise in circle, under the significant stars, the only truly worthy thing that has ever flowed from our lips and our hands, the respectful song of gratitude and hope. Finish. It's late for man. William Ospina.